and it says preparing. So once this uh, screen is up, I'll put up the welcome slide. It says it's done. When you see a message that says that it's live streaming, please let it, me know. It's saying that now. Okay, great. So got it. So now I'm going to share the. Oh. It says it's done. When you see a message that says that it's live streaming, please let it, me know. It's saying that now. Okay, great. So got it. So now I'm going to share the. Is this still live streaming? I see live uh, YouTube and recording. You see live YouTube? Yes. Four minutes to go. Hey, Aria. Michael, how are you? Good morning. We're getting better. Good. Our kidneys are all back to normal and everything? Oh, no, not even close. No, okay, can you go on YouTube and let me know whether it's actually streaming? You see what's going on behind me? You can't tell. Sure, okay. Huh? You're getting fluids? Yeah. Because I had to stop my own. It was uh, still talking when I had stopped talking. So I had to take it off. I think it's live. It says live. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm going to start the webinar. But not yet. We are live now. You know. Now, okay, are you able to meet everyone? Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in whatever part of the world you are. My name is Sharon Sledge and I'm the Patient Blood Management Coordinator at NYU Langone Health in New York, New York, USA. I'd like to give you a warm welcome to our 2022 Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Society Virtual Annual Scientific Conference. So I just wanna give you a little background information about our organization. 
The Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Society is an international multidisciplinary society of experts and stakeholders practicing and promoting the science of providing quality medical care without the use of allogeneic blood with the aims of improving clinical outcomes and protecting patients' rights. The 2022 conference theme is Bloodless Medicine Education, the Ultimate Game Changer. And certainly, uh, Bloodless Medicine Education, that is the um, what will change um, how we practice in terms of bloodless medicine. I'd like to introduce to you my uh, co-moderator, um, Dr. Kelly Arbor Johnson. She's the medical director at the Hyperbaric Medical Center in MedStar Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, D.C. And so I'm going to turn it over to Kelly, but I just want to remind you all that this conference is a three-day conference, and we're hoping that you'll be able to join us every day, November 2nd through the 4th. So now I'd like to turn it over to Kelly Johnson, Arbor, to get us started. Thank you, Sharon, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to this conference. I'm so glad that we have over 160 people um, attending today to learn about bloodless medicine and surgery and how it's practiced across the world. So I would like to um, have the honor of introducing the conference chairman, Mr. Christopher Simoto. Um, he is a general surgeon. He is a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland and also a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh. He currently works as a consultant general surgery physician practicing in Lushania, Zambia, and he will deliver the welcome address for this Congress. Thank you very much, Doctor. The President of the Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Society, the organizing members of the of the society, our international speakers, the panelists and moderators, and all those who have joined virtually around the world. Welcome to the Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Society eighth virtual annual scientific conference and the general meeting. The theme for this conference is Bloodless Medicine Education, the Ultimate Game Changer. And this conference will, take, will span over three days, starting today, November 2nd to November 4th. Education is the key to a positive transformation and nowhere else more than in bloodless medicine. Understanding why and how bloodless medicine improves clinical outcomes is a game changer as it motivates clinicians and patients to embrace this evidence-based approach to patient care confidently. This virtual annual meeting has brought international experts and there will also be abstract presentations. I welcome you all to attend all sessions and actively participate. Thank you very much for putting aside time to attend this meeting. I thank you all. Thank you. Okay. I'd like to thank our conference chairman for those opening remarks. And now I would like to introduce the president of our Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Society, Dr. Nathaniel Yusoro. He's a general surgeon and a fellow of the West African College of Surgeons and a fellow of the International College of Surgeons practicing in Nigeria. Dr. Yusoro, please. Thank you, Sharon, for that kind introduction. And welcome to everyone. We are extending a very warm welcome to you all at this eighth annual scientific meeting of the Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Society. Bloodless medicine is the provision of quality medical care to a wide variety of patients without the use of allogenic blood, that is donor blood. And the Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Society is an international multidisciplinary society of experts and stakeholders in blood transfusion avoidance or bloodless medicine. 
we are the only professional society in the world that is committed to promoting bloodless medicine as the standard of care. We may be a little ahead of our time, but it is obvious to us that this is where evidence-based ethical medicine is ultimately headed at this time. So the Bloodless Medicine and Surgery uh, Society uh, promotes the science of providing quality healthcare without the use of allogenic blood with the aims of improving clinical outcomes and protecting patients' rights. Using the WHO pillar outlined in 2010 by the 63rd World Health Assembly and was later re-emphasized in the WHO policy brief uh, on the urgent need for patient blood management last year, that was 2021. So to the provided, we have added one more pillar, optimizing tissue oxygenation, as you shall see uh, in the presentation. One of the ways that we promote the science of bloodless medicine is through education at our annual meeting, such as we are at now. Of some of the best minds that the medical world has to offer. We have done this seven times already, five times as in person meeting pre pandemic, and twice as virtual meeting since 2020. This is the eighth annual meeting of the Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Society. And this time, the theme is on education itself. Bloodless medicine education, the ultimate game changer. Let me repeat the chairman's words. Uh, put his words down in the flyer. He said, education is key to a positive transformation. And in bloodless medicine. Understanding why and how bloodless medicine improves clinical outcomes is a game changer as it motivates clinicians and patients to embrace the evidence-based approach to patient care confidently. So education makes us more confident. And let me illustrate. Just last week, we received a consult in the bloodless surgery unit in my, in my center where I am. It came from gynae, that's from gynecology. Uh, a case of uh, a female, I think 34 or so, with menorrhagia. Now what sticks in my mind is not her age, but her HB. The HB uh, was 1.1 gram per deal. Initial PCV was 8%. So we were called in by the gynecologist and we requested that hematology should be invited as well as there are members of our bloodless team in hematology. The patient was resuscitated with crystalloids and colloids and we started her on intravenous ion and erythropoietin with the adjuncts, vitamin C, B complex, uh, high protein diet, three liters of fluid daily, fruits, vegetables, oxygen therapy, this is exactly one week since we started. Today is Wednesday. It was last Wednesday that we started this. And today when we checked her hemoglobin, it was 4.4 grams per deal. Vital signs were normal and stable. And she's ambulant, eating well, cheerful. And she has been off oxygen for the past four days or so. In fact, from the first day, I have to say, she took off the oxygen. We were the ones that insisted that she needs to continue on intermittent oxygen. Though she's still on admission and still receiving IV iron and EPO, but she, she wants to go home. Why did the gynae managing team send the consult to us promptly? Instead of wasting precious time trying to persuade or browbeat the patient into accepting a blood transfusion. The reason is because they are knowledgeable in the existence and even superiority of transfusion alternatives. 
why is it that my two house officers who are newly qualified doctors, why are they confidently and successfully administering IV iron with little or no supervision? It is because they both learned about bloodless medicine as undergraduates in my institution and have been part of administering IV iron as students. In other words, they are educated in bloodless medicine. To a good extent, I can say, they are not as educated as the gurus that are here that we are going to learn from. But they do have an idea of bloodless medicine. They know it works and they are not scared. The point I'm making is that we need to imbibe bloodless medicine education, share it with our students and colleagues, and use it to save the lives of our patients lives that would otherwise have been lost. That is why we are here today in this conference. To take us on this journey through bloodless medicine as the ultimate game changer, again, let me repeat, the, these are some of the best minds that the medical world has to offer. It has been said that only the best of the best practice bloodless medicine because it requires not only skills, it also requires careful observance of medical ethics, respect for patient autonomy, non maleficence beneficence, justice, compassion, along with informed consent and informed choices, which are also components of evidence-based medicine. No one who knows the speakers at this meeting intimately would contest the fact that they are some of the best of the best in their chosen fields. They are excellent clinicians. Not only that, they are excellent teachers in the best Hippocratic tradition. Uh, I don't know the oath that nurses take because it's multidisciplinary. But so whichever oath they take, the, the nurses that will talk to all that, other professionals, they are the best. None of them is being paid to speak at this meeting. Of course, we could not possibly afford to pay speakers of such caliber at this point, but they are generally not even interested in being paid to speak. They have a passion for the subject and they speak out of conviction. One of them, a highly respected professor of pathology and laboratory medicine, even took it upon himself to circulate the conference invitation among residents and fellows technical in his center. Why? I'll tell you in his own words. He said, spreading the message as, as far and wide as possible is good for patients. That was Dr. Neil Blomberg. Yes, ultimately, we are doing this for the good of patients because we believe that bloodless medicine benefits patients without harming them. We thank our speakers very much for donating their time and energy at this conference to promote bloodless medicine education for the good of in the midst of other serious engagement like uh, Sherry Ozawa, who is attending a WHO patient blood management implementation committee meeting in Australia right now. And the meetings go into the night. So she'll have to extricate herself from there to give us a talk tomorrow. Some are members of SABM, Society for the Advancement of Patient Blood Management, which is the only organizational affiliate and mother PBM society. Uh, is the only organizational affiliate that we have, that Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Society have. And these speakers from SABM are taking out time to support the Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Society. We thank you all very much, our very learned speakers. We are also grateful to our moderators, panelists, and the conference organizing committee chaired by uh, Mr. Christopher Simutoe. Uh, for those who do not know, uh, surgeons who are fellows of the Royal College do not answer doctor. The answer, Mr. So that's why we are calling him Mr. I'm sure if we said doctor, he'd get offended. So um, 
without these people, we could not have possibly held this meeting. Of course, without the attendees, we would be speaking to ourselves. We could not be very interesting. So we thank you all very much, the attendees as well. We thank you all and we promise that your time spent at Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Society 2022 annual meeting will be time well spent. We wish you fruitful deliberation on Bloodless Medicine education and a great learning experience at BMSS 2022. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Osoro. Those were, it was a wonderful introduction. Um, we are a little ahead of time right now. So I did want to give a few housekeeping tips, just a couple. First of all, uh, it looks like almost everybody has joined on Zoom today. So we do have a couple of interactive features that we can use. Uh, there is a Q&A at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Feel free to put any questions that you have in as we listen to the talks this morning, and we will go through the Q&A section at the end of this particular session. Um, there's also a chat. You can also put comments in the chat, and we will take a look at that as well. And with that, I think we can move on. So again, that was a wonderful introduction by Dr. Usoro. I am now honored to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning, Dr. Aria Shander. Dr. Shander is very, very well known in the field of bloodless medicine. He is currently the Emeritus Chair in the Department of Anesthesiology, Critical Care, Pain Management, and Hyperbaric Medicine, which I'm really happy about because that's my, my specialty also, at Inglewood Hospital and Medical Center in Inglewood, New Jersey. He did his medical school training at University of Vermont and completed a residency in anesthesiology at Montefiore Medical Center in New York. He then completed a fellowship in critical care medicine, and he is board certified in four different specialties in internal medicine, critical care, anesthesiology, and hyperbaric medicine. The title of today's keynote talk is Bloodless Medicine Education, the Ultimate Game Changer. And I am now very honored to welcome Dr. Shander to start his talk. Yeah, let's see. Thank you, Kelly, very much for the introduction. Am I, um, I'm unmuted, I assume. You can hear and see me? Yes. Good. Thank you. So thank you for all for the organizers. Thank you uh, for, again, uh, uh, putting together this wonderful society that I'm uh, a privilege uh, to be part of. And uh, again, uh, speaking now for I don't know what number of years that we've had this, but uh, it's always been very gratifying, uh, not only to see uh, the number of participants, but also our, my colleagues who, as already mentioned, are uh, enthusiastic about this topic. So I was asked to give uh, this uh, particular uh, lecture this morning uh, as Bloodless, uh, the ultimate game changer. But uh, as you could see from the overview, I was asked actually to look at the role of education in terms of the barriers to implementation of bloodless medicine and surgery, as well as some of the prejudices that we see. So I'll start off with something that already has been mentioned, which is the definitions and the terms that we use in bloodless medicine and surgery. And the reason I think that that's important is because language is very powerful. As you see, as I'll progress through my talk, uh, the words that we use and the concepts that we try to get across, we sometimes actually fail uh, in transmitting uh, the best communication that uh, will give us the best results. And one of the things that we see a lot with bloodless medicine and surgery patients is the fact that the language that we use actually creates not only barriers, but immediate prejudices among uh, the uh, uh, the House of Medicine. And I will again uh, mention this and expand on that a little more as my talk uh, proceeds. Uh, the role of education is important. There's something that uh, we need to understand that education is basically transmitting of content. Um, but as uh, already mentioned by uh, Dr. Russo, the fact is that there are skills that also need to be um, learned and the process of learning knowledge or gaining knowledge versus the process of uh, obtaining skills may not be the same and at times could actually be conflicting. So what we need is both. We need the transmission of 
a well-organized body of knowledge. And at the same time, we need some sort of level of apprenticeship uh, to, again, uh, improve or actually uh, give skills of care to those who are uh, taking care of bloodless medicine and surgery. But I think that the one core and already mentioned uh, was the issue of our duty as clinicians. Note that this is not just the duty for physicians, but all of us who care for a patient are within the world of clinicians. And our duty uh, needs to be re-emphasized because again, it is not just a body of knowledge, but also the responsibilities that we have towards ourselves as well as the patient. So this is essentially my overview and uh, we'll move on to uh, the next, uh, the next uh, phase. So bloodless medicine essentially is a misnomer. Uh, again, not like healthcare. I, we talk about healthcare, but in fact, we care for the sick. Uh, it's really sick care, if you will. Uh, the fact that we are striving towards health or at times actually do preventative health. These are the things that, again, you could, you could see from uh, these misnomers that we need to expand the language so that we can, again, transmit the best information. Although these become household terms, uh, they may not transmit the right information. But then we move on to the definition of bloodless medicine and surgery, which is the improving a patient outcome, which is a positive statement with the use of clinical strategies for their medical and surgical care without the use of allogeneic blood products. Uh, it really should be components, but we put that in brackets. The last part is a negative statement. Uh, again, another positive statement is that this is a multimodality approach. So we need to think in terms of this definition is what are it is that we're transmitting to the house of medicine with this definition. And more importantly, when patients who are bloodless patients interface with the medical community. And uh, many of us um, have relied on the fact that patients for whom blood is not an option, which fall into this definition and category, uh, have, have been um, addressed, if you will, or maybe not addressed, but uh, certainly have been considered to be a religious organization. And we do put this as part of the religious organization. We define the, the um, uh, I'm sorry, we define the not refusal, but the decline of use of blood components, as you could see the allogeneic as a religious term. Now, I think again, that puts a barrier in many ways and does cause prejudice also in many ways. And this is what I think, is it a religious matter or is it the patient's choice? And I think if we re reverse everything and just put patients in the front, and start thinking in terms of what patients' choices mean. The religious portion of it may be the driver, but ultimately when a patient comes into the house of medicine and is included into, uh, into any care, whether they, when they move into, again, healthcare, uh, that allows them to have choices in terms of what they are going to accept and what it is that they're gonna decline. And also within those uh, realms of acceptance and, and decline, they may be sorting out different things so that they may accept one thing, but not again, accept another or decline it. And that doesn't necessarily mean that there has to be logic per se uh, in each one of those choices, but ultimately it is the patient's choice. And I think if there is one thing that we take away today is that the religious portion of this meaning the reason why the patient is making a choice is secondary to the fact that they do have the ability to make a choice no matter where they are worldwide. And here's uh, some of what I think uh, we should learn is who benefits from bloodless medicine and surgery. And we define that as patients for whom blood is not an option. And yes, there is a religious group, but again, this is a choice that they can make. Each individual makes a choice regardless of the fact that they belong to a specific community. The alloimmune, 
those patients, again, with underlying uh, hemolytic anemias and others, that's not a choice anymore. Uh, this is, again, something that they can't accept because of the detrimental effects that it will, uh, will have on their health. So again, uh, again, these patients do accept allogeneic transfusion, but now they've become bloodless without a choice. And when blood is not available, these are again, not an issue of choices, but they're also very limited in terms of uh, defining when uh, these uh, patients become bloodless because it's a very short period of time. If they survive, uh, they can go to a, a, an area where they can get their best care, uh, but at that point, blood may be available. Whether it's military operations or civilian injuries with prolonged evacuation is uh, those, and again, that's not necessarily a choice issue. But when blood uh, that is available is unsafe, and as an example, we just, uh, we're seeing sort of in, in a side view mirror, not in the rear view mirror, uh, COVID-19. And here again, if COVID-19 was transmitted and caused disease due to transfusion, here again, we have no choice uh, rather than uh, the first one, which is a patient's um, ability to choose uh, whether they are, uh, whether blood is um, something that they want to get or not. Uh, I just want to bring this to everyone's attention, and that is that bloodless sudden surgery was recognized in um, 2001 after the New York uh, disaster with the Twin Towers uh, by uh, the U.S. military as uh, ways of caring for those uh, injured combatants who required significant uh, transport times, but also at very high altitude um, and cold, uh, which is open helicopter evacuation. Uh, so this was recognized already that there was a positive impact of caring for patients without blood that improved their outcome. So others have kept their eyes open on what it is that we in a bloodless medicine and surgery do. And as you could see, a few organizations came together and took the protocols for bloodless medicine and surgery and adopted them uh, to, uh, for the military. And that was done actually rapidly almost overnight. So the underbelly of discrimination is again, when a patient is challenging what we do in, in normally in medicine. Um, and one of the concerns that many uh, physicians have, rightfully or wrong, but it is a concern, is that if they do not use blood, it creates a liability for them if there's a negative outcome for the patient. What is interesting is if they do use blood and there is negative outcome, the concern is not there as much as it is for, again, caring for patients for whom blood is not an option. And in this particular article, uh, both Gina Lowell uh, Dixon tried to, again, reassure the individuals that this is not just a choice of the patient, but that the choice is part of their advanced directive so that uh, care should uh, proceed. I think this is somewhat of a... Um, a pedestrian way of looking at this, I think that uh, rather than looking at the uh, implications of the legal uh, and the authoritarian uh, processes that are out there, that one should really be looking at the duty of the clinician rather than looking at the protection of the clinician from a patient who makes a rational and a, again, uh, a choice that they are not only allowed, but have the uh, capability and the autonomy to exercise it. So I think, again, we could see in the literature that there are some issues that uh, we need to address uh, as part of our education. And uh, you could see the subtitle here being the surgical and the ethical challenge, although they are not uh, really looking at uh, the ethical challenge here in the way I would, um, I would address it. And we do have data 
And one of the nice things that we see is this is transfusion-free management of gastrointestinal bleeding. This is an experience of a bloodless institute. And what we're starting to see is the burgeoning, if you will, data that's being published now in terms not necessarily just of success stories, but I think also in the terms of analyzing the process of what we're doing and really giving our clinicians uh, the tools uh, to address uh, some of these um, some of these uh, uh, challenging situation. And as you know, gastrointestinal bleeding is a major challenge in medical patients. And here uh, you see that there is the uh, different uh, variables that they'll be looking at in terms of the number of patients. And this is not a large study, but again, I don't think it's a small study. And they just break down uh, in terms of uh, where these patients are from, what kind of patients they are, some of the comorbidity, and you could see the location of the bleeding. And also what they looked at is the mortality. And you could see that uh, here, even the mortality, which was considered to be 100% for patients who have a hemoglobin less than three grams per, per deciliter, that is not the case here. We're looking at less than 50%. And this is an organized, uh, well-established protocol for treating patients who are having uh, upper and lower GI bleed for whom blood is not an option within a bloodless institute uh, in the United States. When we had started, and some of this you've already heard me talk about, um, we had some concerns. Uh, we, are, we are basically leaving what is considered by the House of Medicine to be the standard of care. The standard of care calls for transfusing patients when their hemoglobin is low or when the PT is elevated or INR that they get plasma. And of course, platelet counts, uh, whatever they are is arbitrary, uh, denotes the use of platelets. And here we are now uh, caring for patients without any of the blood components. So are we experimenting in essence? Have we moving out the standard of care? Does that now uh, constitute human experimentation? And if so, is that ethical to do? Uh, because the last thing we want to do is to take advantage of a population of individuals who are making a choice that makes them vulnerable. And making them vulnerable means that, again, they're looking for anyone who would help them or care for them without the use of allogeneic products, uh, blood products, as mentioned, or components. And uh, the issue, of course, is, um, is this, does this constitute an, uh, an unethical experiment, meaning that this is a, a group of individuals who are vulnerable, meaning that there are they'll accept anything other than the blood, and therefore we could do anything to sort of help them. So uh, that was one. And the other, of course, as you could see from number four, uh, if this is ethical, how do we challenge, uh, challenge our colleagues' years of tradition yet remain respectful? So how do we recruit more individuals into this? Because at the time when we started this, there was no data to support a lot of what we're doing. It was mostly anecdotal. So we did get uh, both IRB as well as ethics committee involved. And we also went to the, at the time, the senior um, advisor to the AMA on medical ethics, uh, Professor Ken Kipnis, uh, the late Professor Ken Kipnis, who actually coined the term that Jehovah's Witnesses are heretics in the cathedrals of medicine, because they're not only just challenging the standard of care, they're really challenging some of the ethical issues that we have to address within medicine. Now, well, how do you look at progress? Well, here's one where outside, we're outside the standard of care. This is uh, Christian Barnard, some of you may know, or some of you may be too young to remember. This was the surgeon who dared the story of the first human to human heart transplant. So again, to do that is, is this human experimentation. We can identify the needs. We can identify uh, the need of a heart transplant. We can identify the failure of someone's heart or any other organ. But before um, we have any
I can't hear. Did we just lose connection? We lost a connection. Um, it is back. Yes. It's back, but where? What was I? Where? What slide did I lose you at? Ooh, I could see fine things. It was that yeah. the Christian. Oh, what's that? Christian Hard Barnard. to watch transplant. Mm -hmm. I can't hear. The next slide. So this is where it lost connection. Correct. Yes. Okay. So, uh, do you remember what you heard last about this? The fact that we're outside the standard of care to make the leap into something which is new mm -hmm. and has not been tried, uh, very similar to what we did with patient uh, blood management and what we've done with bloodless medicine of surgery, which was the precursor to patient uh, blood management. Uh, here again, uh, you could see that many problems to be answered. So, you're starting off on the road that doesn't have all the answers. And the same thing happens with bloodless medicine and surgery. We do have success stories, but we also have failures. And part of this issue is that we need to learn from the failures to be able to, again, build our knowledge uh, so that we again can transmit it to those who are going to care for patients, including also adding skills. And we work through a lot of problems when it comes to any new um, innovation that we have in medicine as one example. And I just bring you uh, Felix uh, Blaisberg uh, picture over here with uh, Christian Bernard. Uh, the reason he was not the first to have a heart transplant, but he was actually the first to be discharged from the hospital. The others were not discharged from the hospital and actually perished. So the changes that we're expecting are not gonna happen overnight. And it's going to be not only just a challenge, uh, but of course that we're gonna revel in the successes, but we can't expect that we're not gonna have failures and those failures really are the steps forward. And uh, we have to be, again, very grateful for the courage of those patients who, uh, who gave their lives in many ways uh, to advance medicine. And we shan't forget uh, the fact that many patients for whom blood is not an option and many uh, Jehovah's Witnesses have perished while we were uh, building our knowledge of uh, bloodless medicine and surgery, but also many have perished because of the prejudice uh, that were was invoked because of the quote unquote refusal or declining or making a choice that uh, went against what the standard of care and what physicians had in mind that was life quote unquote saving. So we call it the unmet medical need. And uh, what I, I think is a very, very important is that you're going to treat patients for whom blood is not an option. So to deliver bloodless care, we need to know blood. And we need to start off with understanding what blood does, not necessarily transfusion, but what blood does. And then as we build on this knowledge, before we even get to the skills, we also need to know what does allogeneic blood and its components does. So again, knowledge and practice may not be the same thing here, and they're not, uh, but we need to build our knowledge base by understanding number one, blood, if we're gonna do bloodless, and then understanding uh, the actual activities and the work that uh, allogeneic blood does. And this actually builds, if you will, confidence, as mentioned already before, in terms of knowledge. So here's knowledge in terms of uh, possible reasons for red cell transfusion overuse. Uh, this came out of the Middle East and Israel, was published in 2017, looking at overall knowledge scores of physicians in a single institution about blood and red cell transfusion. So we're not even talking about plasma and the others. And you could see that the score is less than 50%, what we call not a passing grade by any means. And there's a distribution of knowledge as you see from this particular graph. But the fact of the matter is that even those who use blood 
don't know much about it, meaning the allogeneic components. And yet we who are not going to be using blood with bloodless patients need to make sure that our knowledge is much higher than this so that we at least can uh, build, if you will, our knowledge in the right direction uh, based on this. And uh, again, uh, this just to show you that this is not something new. This was uh, published in 1990 by Suzanne Salem Schatz and others looking at the influence of clinical knowledge, organizational context, and practice style on transfusion decision making. This shows again that the amount of transfused blood components was inversely proportional to physician knowledge of transfusion medicine. So you could see that as we build more and more knowledge, we may end up being on the spectrum of those who, who transfuse least, but here we're talking about transfusing zero. But knowledge is important in terms of getting us to that because we now understand what other things can be done other than just relying on what is considered to be the standard under these, um, these uh, recommendations. And here you see other, other publications, uh, some of them as are repeated, but the fact of the matter that this is an area of, of um, skill which is lacking in addition due to very lack of knowledge and a very confused practice for patients. And lastly, is looking at uh, a blood transfusion, one unit too much, or one unit too few, which strategy poses the smallest risk to the patient. And here, uh, this is by the blood establishment. Uh, and here we are saying that the best transfusion strategy and optimal dosing for packed red cells are still missing in most indications. Sufficiently powered, prospective, randomized control, clinical transfusion trials for packed red cells in most clinical settings are urgently needed to reduce ill-founded clinical decisions and to base transfusion strategies and clinical evidence and scientific study results. How is this not going to improve the knowledge of our bloodless uh, uh, clinicians? Of course it will, because you could see here from this particular description by the blood establishment that knowledge is lacking, yet practice goes on and is can be as, as we already know, harmful versus uh, withholding and not even including transfusion as a therapy for patients as what we do with bloodless, where that actually can improve outcome. So there's no formal uh, training other than this particular uh, symposium, which has been going on on an annual basis. Um, but let's go back to when we actually were uh, starting to look at bloodless surgery and bloodless medicine as an organized way of delivering care. And of course, some of you may know Sharon Vernon uh, and others who have been uh, pioneers in terms of getting education together. And this particular publication in the American Journal of Nursing in 1997 uh, is a reflection of the school, if you will, uh, that taught bloodless surgery. And Are You Ready for Bloodless Surgery was the title of this article. Well, you're not going to be ready unless you get knowledge transferred and skills. And Sharon was very good and is very good in, in transmitting both information in a very organized fashion and also identifying the needed skill to deliver a positive outcome of bloodless medicine and surgery. Well, this has not survived uh, uh, Sharon and many of us, unfortunately. So this remains, if you will, uh, one of the drivers uh, left this, this particular bloodless medicine society uh, and these educational symposiums that are there as the only driver for education versus going to a specific location, which was a school uh, to get both your knowledge and skill. They're not the same as already mentioned, but I think that that's something that I'd like to emphasize again and again, that uh, the fact that uh, if you don't have knowledge, it doesn't mean that you may not have the skills. Uh, however, having knowledge and the skill together, even though there are different channels, makes for the best uh, way of clinicians delivering uh, bloodless medicine and surgery. But what can we teach without being in a specific uh, four walls classroom? Well, we can teach the principles of medical ethics, 
uh, depicted here are the pillars of autonomy, beneficence, malfeasance, and justice, uh, and also teach the duty of the clinician. Unfortunately, most of the language uh, that's out there in terms of the duties of the clinicians refers to the physician. But since we, multi we uh, have, need a multidisciplinary approach to bloodless medicine and surgery, every time you'll see the word physician, please translate that to clinician. And again, there is also the responsibilities of the patient. So there is two sides of the coin. One is ours, uh, which uh, is, is built with, as you could see on this particular um, uh, slide, dignity and honesty of those providing care, and then relying on the, pill the four pillars, although there are seven there are three more pills, but these are the major pillars of medical ethics. Um, I just want to reiterate and digress a little bit because we do have the time. Not much is new under the sun. And most of us think of medical ethics as being born uh, not in, in Western medicine, if you will, in the United States. But a lot of these principles have been around, as you could see, for centuries. This was the Hammurabi Code from 1750 B.C., uh, the Code of Hammurabi, uh, the King of Babylon, is the first ever recorded legislations, a rule governing the practice of medicine. The Code highlights the fact that physicians, clinicians, perform a service to the society treating ailments and sickness. Again, the healthcare uh, paradigm. In return, physicians are paid money, but also were punished if the results of the surgery treatment ended up killing the patient. Well, I think we are a little... Uh, different today, although some of this uh, remains actually in practice in some countries, um, mostly uh, some in the Middle East. And then there was the Hippocratic Oath, uh, which came around at 450 BC. I will use treatments for the benefit of the ill in accordance with my ability, skill, and my judgment, knowledge, but that from which is to their harm or an injustice, I will keep them. First, do no harm. Now, most of you think that first do no harm came from actually Hippocrat the Hippocratic Oath, but actually this, uh, this sentence or this concept uh, came later in the 1800s in one lecture, which credited Hippocrates uh, for this, but the lecture was the one that actually initiated this particular statement. And some of our um, Islam uh, uh, colleagues, this is from the 19th, 9th, sorry, 9th century. This is the Adab al-Tabib, the ethics of the physician, the first ever book dedicated to medical ethics. We're in the West, we're behind. Great and, and very paternalistic, but great importance of a physician clinician's faith in God and personal health and hygiene, as well as his or her manner with his or her colleagues, nurses, and patients. Again, the multidisciplinary approach. Fees charged for rich patients should be enough to cover the expense of poor patients. Uh, well, this is interesting because that's what we do in the United States many times is we cost shame, uh, as, uh, shift. Uh, doctors should keep records that's clinicians should keep records of patients' symptoms, treatments, and progress so that they may be reviewed by peers should the patient die under the care of that particular. Again, keep in mind what we talked about before. Failures will happen, and we need to be able to re review them so that we can learn more. And this is 19th century. And last, uh, Muhammad ibn uh, Zakaria el Razi. Uh, from 854 to 925, not a long life, but pretty long then. The doctor's aim is to do good even to our enemies, so much more to our friends. My profession forbids us to do harm to our kindred. God imposed a, uh, on physicians the oath not to compose uh, mortiferous uh, remedies. So again, you're looking at uh, maybe the physician or clinician in terms of guidance, and the guidance is all there in terms of being an advocate for the patient. And this goes back many, many years. 
So medical, uh, this is not just Western medicine as already, but medical ethics codes uh, are all over uh, the world. You have the World Medical Association, the British Medical Association, one, and the American Medical Association. And I think as we build education and knowledge, it's very important for us to understand the code of medical ethics. I use the AMA only because it's closer to me, but keep in mind that the AMA uh, principles of medical ethics are no different than all the others I just showed you. So the practice of medicine and its embodiment in the clinical encounter between a patient and a clinician is fundamentally a moral activity. Again, keep that in mind. That's a very important statement that arises from the imperative to care for patients and to alleviate suffering, regardless of their choices. It doesn't say here anything about the choice of a patient, good or bad. It has to do with what the clinician's responsibility and duty is. The, relation, the relationship with the patient and the clinician is based on trust, which gives rise to physicians' ethical responsibility or clinicians' responsibility to place patients' welfare above the clinician's own self-interest or obligations to other to use sound medical judgment, knowledge, and on the patient's behalf and to advocate for their patient's welfare. Keep in mind, this is the principle of medical ethics across the globe, not just in the United States. And these words don't have anything in terms of what the patient's choice is and whether we're stepping outside the standard of care, regardless of what it is, it defines our fiduciary responsibility as clinicians to the patient. Uh, there are exceptions. The patient requests care that is beyond the physician's competence, the skill. Uh, this is the skill of the clinician or the scope of practice. Okay, that's not unreasonable. No one should be, uh, not everybody, if you're an internist and you're asked to do brain surgery, you don't have that within your scope of practice. So that's not an unreasonable exception. It doesn't mean the care should stop. It just gives the clinician a understanding that there, that there are limits on what they can actually deliver to patient. Is known to be scientifically invalid as no medical indication or cannot reasonably be expected to achieve the intended clinical benefit. Well, we've seen a lot of that during COVID-19, but keep in mind that we're trying to be as much evidence-based, but I also showed you that our practice of transfusion medicine is clearly not scientific not necessarily invalid, but the medical indications are not clear because everything was around safety and not benefit. It's incompatible with the physician's deeply held personal, religious, or moral beliefs in keeping with ethics guidance on the exercise of, of uh, conscience. And again, keep in mind that's the clinician. So the example is abortion for a devoted Catholic, the ethical transfer of care needs to be carried out not just denying the patient care, but finding someone who would do that. I want to bring you again, because of time, uh, uh, to the last of the list of exceptions. The physician or clinician lacks the resources needed to provide safe, competent, respectful care for individual. Physicians may not decline to accept the patient for reasons that would constitute discrimination against a class or category of patient. Well, we've seen that time and time again uh, in bloodless medicine and surgery patients. And yet it's been written for years now that this is unconscionable when it comes to medical ethics. Meeting the medical needs of the prospective patient could seriously compromise the physician's ability to provide care needed by his or, other, uh, or, his or her other patients uh, this is the issue of triage, which is a little more complex. And this, again, goes not the physician, but all clinicians. But we have a way of addressing that. But the last, the greater the prospective patient's medical need, however, the stronger is the clinician's obligation to provide care in keeping with the professional obligations to promote access to care. So we started off with a slide I showed you, the legal concerns the clinicians have. But again, when you're looking at the medical or the house of medicine or the medical profession and the codes of ethics, they're all 
ob ob obligatory, if you will, and the fiduciary responsibility of every clinician is to care for a patient regardless of the choice. And also, again, a word against discrimination. So it brings us to the power of language, which is, uh, well, Jehovah's Witness patients or bloodless patients refuse blood, they decline blood, they choose not to have blood. The answer is no, which is all negative. The problem with this is that we need to change our approach. And changing our approach from negative to positive is essential because when we say to a clinician, we will not accept blood, uh, what the clinicians many times hear is that you're not going to accept anything. And there is what you see, what the clinicians hear when I refuse or decline results in a disaster. And we've seen many and will see many disasters due to this language. So we need to find a way of delivering the positive message, which is we accept everything. Uh, however, uh, in, in lieu of, say, uh, blood components, we accept X, Y, and Z. And I have to credit Fran, uh, Franz uh, Walker from Austria for actually switching the declining language to an acceptance language. And we'll see how that uh, is developed over the time since they're just now starting to implement it. So in summary, definitions and terms, is it a choice? And I think that we need to move the religious issue to the back and really highlight the fact that every patient has a choice regardless of their religion, regardless of their creed or any other reasons. The barriers and the prejudices we already demonstrated, they're unethical. And as clinicians, our responsibility is not first to the law, but first to the moral code. And let me just say this, it doesn't mean that we're not law-abiding citizens. Uh, and many times we can actually follow and abide by the law and still remain moral and ethical. But there are times when ethics or morals clash with, um, with the legal system, as we could see is happening today in the United States uh, with this issue of Dobbs. Uh, and there have been other issues uh, where the legal clashes with the moral. I think I've said, mentioned this before to people that in the United States, slavery was legal, but it was never ethical. So the role of education, sadly, uh, is minimal, but it is essential. And the education we need to define and see if we can go back to, again, the principles that we know from uh, Sharon Vernon of setting not only in motion a well thought out curriculum, but making sure that that includes also learning the skills and it's done in an organized fashion, just the way we're learning any other uh, medical uh, discipline. And as you saw in terms of the, as I use the example of a heart transplant, we're collecting more and more data and that's a role and also duty to collect data on our patients uh, who are bloodless, not just in terms of anecdote, but as I showed you in an organized fashion with one publication that I use as an example. And the duty of the clinician is the ultimate game changer in my mind, which encompasses everything, including the elimination of prejudice, the elimination of barriers, insisting on knowing the skills and the right education. And if the future is right, the success of bloodless medicine and surgery will be in its demise. And what that means is, is that we will no longer need to have bloodless medicine or surgery as a specific uh, service, if you will, that every bloodless medicine and surgery patient can enter into any hospital wherever they are across the globe and get the right care because it will become standard and therefore we don't need to allocate BMS or bloodless medicine and surgery as a separate track for patients. And I thank you for your uh, the privilege of your time. Thank you, Dr. Shander. That was really wonderful, a very thought provoking, um, a great way to kick off this meeting. I, I do want to emphasize to everyone, if you're starting out in bloodless medicine, the importance of language, just like Dr. Shander said, the use of the 
words um, refuse and decline, just uh, they have such a negative connotation and it just sets up the patient encounter for being confrontational, even if it's not meant to be confrontational. The choice of words can really affect how we approach our patients and engage in discussions with them. So I think that was a wonderful discussion to have. And again, I thank Dr. Shander for that very wise and provoking presentation. So now I would like to reintroduce our Bloodless Medicine and Surgical Society president, Dr. Nathaniel Usoro, to introduce the next speaker who is going to be the fourth Bloodless Medicine and Surgical Society REA Shander lecturer. Dr. Usoro. Sorry, I'm trying to get my slides. Again, while Dr. Usoro is um, getting his slides ready, remember to put all of your Q&A in the Q&A box on the Zoom, please. Thank you very much, uh, Kelly, for uh, bringing me back on board. So as Dr. Johnson Abo mentioned, uh, we are now on to a major feature of our annual meeting, and that is the BMSS Arya Shanda Lecture. And the, uh, we need to know that this has a feature of our annual meetings since 2019. And the aim of this lecture is to promote the science and practice of bloodless medicine and surgery with the aims of improving clinical outcomes and protecting patients' rights. So we keep this in mind. It's not just about patients who decline blood transfusion. Sometimes we, the clinicians, go out to actually offer. That's what we should do. We should offer bloodless care to improve clinical outcomes because the patients who don't decline blood transfusion still have rights to better outcome, which happens when we avoid blood transfusion. So the Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Society chooses as the lecturer, a person with a track record of outstanding academic and or clinical work in bloodless medicine and surgery. Of course, the uh, clinic, uh, Dr. Arya Shanda, he doesn't need introduction in the area of uh, bloodless medicine and surgery. He is definitely a pioneer and he is very much with us. We just listened to him um, speak to us. And he's also, as he pointed out, uh, a bona fide or in uh, American English, bona fide uh, member of the Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Society. And uh, he's been going all over the world, teaching us how to apply bloodless surgery techniques to improve outcomes. And he came over here to Nigeria in 2019, can see him there, uh, to, to give talks. He was the very first BMSS Arishanda lecturer, and he gave his talk on 31st of October, 2019. That was during the fifth annual scientific conference of the Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Society, uh, which was held in the University of Calabar in Nigeria. Interestingly, the theme of his talk or his lecture was from blood management to bloodless medicine, back to the future. Uh, Dr. Shanda was requested to speak on this topic without any knowledge of the fact that he wrote a paper that sounded similar, but somewhat in reverse. We had no idea at all, uh, but it was a wonderful lecture. And uh, the following year, the second BMSS Arya Shanda lecturer was Dr. Bruce Peace. And he gave his lecture November 6, 2020, at the sixth annual scientific conference of BMSS. This time, we had to use the we uh, Zoom webinar platform like we're using now because we were into the pandemic year. Dr. Spee spoke on bloodless medicine, bridging the gap 
between knowledge and practice. So you can see how we try to agree on a topic that is very relevant uh, to, to the practice of bloodless medicine and also to our patient care uh, being associated with better outcomes. The third BMS is Aria Shanda lecturer was Dr. Stephen Prime, and he gave his lecture last year, November 3rd. That was the seventh annual scientific conference of the Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Society. Again, it was a webinar uh, platform on Zoom, and the theme was safety and quality of care as drivers of bloodless medicine. We are now in 2022, and we are on the second day of November 2022, uh, which is the first day of our annual scientific conference. And for now, we have our BMS's Ariashanda lectures on the first day of the conference. So we are going to have our fourth BMS's Ariashanda lecture entitled Treatment of Iron Deficiency, a New Paradigm. And we are very, very privileged indeed to have as a lecturer, Dr. Michael Auerbach, who is uh, in private practice hematology and oncology in Baltimore, Maryland, USA, and is a professor of medicine in Georgetown University School of Medicine, Washington, DC, USA. So uh, we already said, this um, about Dr. Auerbach. I have been privileged to listen to him a couple of times in SABM uh, meetings. And uh, he is a professor of professors. It was from him that I gathered the confidence to use uh, ion dextrin uh, without problems. Uh, Dr. Auerbach, got his medical degree free of, sorry about the wrong spelling of New York there, uh, Medical College, Valhalla, New York. Internship and residency was in internal medicine at Cleveland Clinic Foundation in Ohio, and the fellowship training in hematology and oncology at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center and Harlem Hospital Center in New York, New York. He had his research fellowship in thrombosis and hemostasis at Columbia. And uh, Dr. Albert is both certified in internal medicine and in the subspecialties of hematology and medical oncology. He has authored and co-authored over 180 journal articles, books, chapters, and meeting abstracts. Most recently, these have been focusing on intraviral supplementation in pregnancy and in patients with restless leg syndrome. Dr. Albach is the author of The Treatment of Iron Deficiency in Adults, Anemia in Pregnancy, and Diagnosis and Causes of Iron Deficiency for Up to Date, which you know is a very uh, fantastic online resource for clinicians. Dr. Albach is a member of numerous professional organizations and is a fellow of the American College of Physicians. He is an honorary emeritus member of the American Society of Hepatology, and he currently serves on the scientific board of the Network for Advancement of Transfusion Alternatives. Um, and he advises the Society for the Advancement of Patient Blood Management. He is also on the editorial boards of the American Journal of Hematology, Blood Transfusion, and Expert Reviews of Hematology. In 2020, along with three of his colleagues, he participated in the first educational session ever delivered on the use of IBI at the American Society of Hematology uh, annual meeting. In 2016, he presented another on complete replacement dosing in an initial brief single visit. In December 2017, he was the principal author of the first prospective study of the travenous ion in pregnancy performed in the United States which was published in the American Journal of Medicine. So you will agree with me that it's difficult to find anybody else as qualified, talk less of less, of, I'm sorry, talk less of more qualified to speak on 
ion therapy than Dr. Auerbach. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the fourth BMSS Arya Shanda lecturer, Dr. Michael Auerbach. Thank you, Dr. Soro. That was certainly an amazing introduction. I'm going to make an attempt today to take you through a, a new paradigm for the treatment of what is the commonest malady on the planet, and that's iron deficiency. Uh, but I, I have a question. Are we going to use your slides or should I screen share? Please share your slides. So okay, I'm going to do that right now. Where is the slideshow? Um, I'm having trouble getting the slideshow. There it is. Okay. Can you see it? Okay, terrific. I am not yeah. seeing, is it anybody? Okay, it's beginning to screen. Yes, we do see it. Okay, oh, good. No, we're seeing it. All right. So I, I am indeed in private practice in Baltimore Medicine and my colleagues and I, and I, and there are three of us, see 50 to 70 new patients per week, most of whom are anemic. We do 70 iron infusions per week and we have positive, Positive, positively impacted the lives of thousands of people who have miserable symptoms of iron deficiency. So when we're done today, I would like you to be able to distinguish the need for oral or intravenous iron for the treatment of iron deficiency. I would like you to be able to be familiar with the formulations and I'm gonna show you which are available in the United States and elsewhere um, so we don't get confused about what are available to you. Most importantly, and I'm gonna remind you that I'm gonna show you this at least a half a dozen times, I'd like you to be able to differentiate the symptoms associated with minor infusion reactions from the vanishingly rare symptom of severe hypersensitivity, which can lead to anaphylaxis. And then, in just a few disease states, we're gonna review treatment approaches with iron supplementation, and then you can make a decision on your own about whether or not what I am telling you seems cogent. I do promise you that everything I'm telling you is evidence-based, and when is it opinion-based alone, I will say that. So let's take a look. Oral iron has been used since the 1500s when Sydenham put iron filings in cold wine to treat what was called the green sickness. <coughs> Loud renamed it chlorosis in 1832, and he was the first to use ferrous sulfate. By the time the American Civil War came along in the 1860s, it was used to treat war wounds, and today it is the most common mi micronutrient deficiency on the planet. So just think for a second the magnitude of this affects more than 35% of the world's population and half of gravitas. It's a hundred times more prevalent than all cancer combined. You'll see what it does in terms of the WHO criteria for years lived with disability shortly. And here we are more than 500 years later using the often ineffective, but usually poorly tolerated iron oral iron as our frontline therapy. <clears throat> so there, I just told you, I would tell you this, there are almost 3 billion cases in the world. In every single country on the planet, it's in the top five causes of years live with disability, and that's a WHO statistic, world health. It's the leading cause of years live with disability in lower and middle income countries. And in 35 countries around the world, it's number one. It's in the top three in the United States. These next few slides are disturbing. And I believe that we are seeing this because women have been made second-class citizens by medicine throughout the world until very recently. 
This is using the 95 per, 95th percentile to determine hemoglobin cutoffs. It is abjectly ridiculous that 12 grams of hemoglobin is considered normal for a woman. Most women in the world are iron deficient. If you take an 18-year-old girl and do a bone marrow, there's a 58% chance there will be no stainable iron. And I did not tell you anything else about her other than she was female. This is even more bothersome. Take a look at the normal values that you see for serum ferritin and look to see where the cutoff values for anemia are. 15 is what we see from Quest and LabCorp. That is a ridiculous number because a ferritin of 30 has a 98% specificity and 92% sensitivity for absent marrow hemosiderin, means no stores. Another bothersome slide. Iron deficiency is the disease. Iron deficiency anemia is its end stage. Look where storage iron present disappears long before anemia occurs. And iron deficiency independent of anemia is associated with a significant litany of symptoms, which we'll go over shortly. So if you are a clinician taking care of a patient and they tell you you are tired, they are tired, it's a pretty nonspecific symptom. We just published a paper, however, on the frequency of pagophagia, which is a pathological craving for ice. Now, <clears throat> for those of you on the other side of the pond, pagophage is less common. I believe clay and dirt are more common in Africa and India than a craving for ice, and certainly in the United Kingdom, largely because of the availability. But almost 50% of iron deficient patients have a pathological craving for ice. Another almost 50% have restless leg syndrome to a degree that they have to get up at night, interferes with spouses, increases the exhaustion that is associated with iron lack, and that's independent of anemia. Brittle integument, I think you know about, but we'll limit our discussion of that. That's fingernails and hair. So I, I just want to say something. We just published in the American Journal of Hematology the frequency of pagophagia and restless leg syndrome on 1,000 consecutive non-selective patients asked prospectively on presentation if they had pagophagia or restless leg syndrome. And the number is over 50% for one or the other. When you see an anemic patient, do you routinely examine the tongue carefully? Look at this woman's tongue. It looks as if it were sandpapered. There are no papillae. If you have a mirror, look at your own tongue right now. It should have white dots covering the entire surface. They're the normal papillae. When you replace iron, and I chose this patient for a reason, you can see how the white dots come back. Now, they're still not completely covering the tongue, but you should be able to guess what this woman has. This is a patient with hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, the world's second most common bleeding disorder. They are abjectly miserable without, iron, uh, without intravenous iron. It is cruel and irresponsible to use oral iron to maintain uh, their stores. It negatively alters the gut, and there is no credible expectation that it will keep up with the losses. Intravenous iron is a game changer for this group of people with a rather difficult illness. So I don't wanna leave this conversation and say oral iron should not be used. I don't use it very often, but there are indications. If you have mild, uncomplicated iron deficiency without active blood loss, it's perfectly effective. I'm gonna show you there should be a new paradigm for the use of oral iron. We'll get to that in a minute. 
in the first trimester of pregnancy, there is no safety data with IV iron. I did not say it was dangerous, but we don't have safety data. I've treated between seven and 8,000 gravitas. We have zero serious adverse events and zero negative outcomes with babies. And for those of you who think that there is not much difference between zero and one, I beg to differ. I like the number zero and would be very disappointed if that number moves to one. In the second trimester of pregnancy, oral iron is probably useful if the hemoglobin is greater than 10. But I will also show you some slides about delivery of iron to the baby um, in the second and third trimester that should make you rethink the use of oral iron. So where is IV iron indicated? Well, if there is intolerance of oral iron, which is in the majority of people, you should immediately switch to IV iron. Why put somebody through the iterations of a medication that causes significant gastrointestinal perturbation in more than 75% of people to whom it is prescribed? In the second trimester of pregnancy, if the hemoglobin is less than 10, because none gets to the baby who needs it for normal brain development, at any time in the third trimester, it is my opinion, let me make it clear here, that oral iron should be proscribed in the third trimester, which means never offered. We never do. IV iron should be frontline. After bariatric surgery, where it's not absorbed and negatively alters the microbiome, in abnormal uterine bleeding, the commonest cause on earth where there's no credible expectation you will keep up with losses, inflammatory bowel disease where it actually makes the disease worse independent of anemia by having a toxic effect on the gut epithelium and again, negatively altering the microbiome, promoting the growth of incommodious bacteria. In angiodysplasia, I've already told you, you cannot keep up with the losses. And whenever you have a comorbid condition with iron-restricted erythropoiesis, oral iron does not work. A perfect example of that is chemotherapy-induced anemia or anemia of dialysis. Now I'm showing you this because I want to talk about which irons are likely to really be a game changer. I do not want to say that ferric gluconate and iron sucrose are bad irons. They work, they're safe, they're effective but they take four to seven infusions to do what the other four can do in one in 15 to 60 minutes. Four to seven IVs, four to seven chances for an extravasation, four to seven chances for a minor infusion reaction, which I'm gonna show you. So don't get impatient. I promise you, I'm gonna show you. It's amazing that we actually have this video. But the other four can be administered in a single setting and you are done after that one setting. These are the approved dosing, and I think it's time to understand that approval for these irons have no, no reasonableness anymore. The actual approval for low molecular weight iron dextran, this is the product that Dr. Usoro said he has learned to use, is 100 milligrams over two minutes. It's irresponsible, it's cruel, it requires 10 doses to do what you can do in one, it has no safety or efficacy advantage, and it costs much more because visits are not free. Ferromoxetol is approved to be given in two doses. You can give it in one, I've published it seven times. There's no difference whatsoever in safety or efficacy, and that includes pregnancy. Ferric carboxy maltose is different in the United States than it is uh, on the other side of the ocean. You have a 500 and 1,000 milligram vial, which makes it far more felicitous to administer as one dose. But for some reason in the United States, we have a 750 milligram vial. It's an expensive formulation and it requires two visits. It's not the end of the world, but it's certainly easier to do to give 1,000 at once. And which makes it far more felicitous. Why am I hearing myself as an echo? All right. And ferric derisomaltose, the newest formulation, is the only one actually approved for total dose infusion. But as I just told you, approval doesn't really matter. These drugs can all be given 
as a single one-time dose. We use a fair amount of ferric derisomaltose, giving a gram in 20 minutes. <coughs> Adverse events occur. But now it's very important that we define them. Oral iron causes constipation, metallic taste, nausea, gastric cramping, and thick, green, tenacious stool. I do not wish to sound gross, but we normally don't ask people about bowel movements and the difficulty wiping after, after a bowel movement, especially when pregnant. Pregnant women are constipated because of the elevated progesterone levels that slow bowel transit and then the enlarging uterus pressing posteriorly on the rectum. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, give me just one second. Can someone disconnect me, please? Okay. Um, intravenous iron does cause infusion reactions one to 3% of the time. I'm going to show you one. This is a real big deal because it is these infusion reactions and the mismanagement of them that fuel the folklore about intravenous iron danger that you all learned when you were in school. Severe hypersensitivity is vanishingly rare. It is actually less frequent with IV iron than it is with penicillin. So I'm not gonna spend any time talking about the management of it because if you're gonna give an intravenous formulation of anything, you need to be prepared to handle acute hypersensitivity. It's far more common with antibiotics, intravenous gamma globulin, and chemotherapy than with intravenous iron. Now, this is a pretty high quality meta-analysis of prospective studies comparing oral iron to placebo and intravenous iron. As you can see, all of the gray boxes are to the right of the unity bar. Okay, so, so I just don't leave all of you in uh, suspense. Uh, I was in Portugal at the HHT meetings. I developed um, a, uh, an acute viral or foodborne illness. And I thought I was being careful, but when I came back to the United States, I had acute renal failure, I'm getting better but daily hydration definitely improves things. So I am now having my IV removed and uh, I will be fine. Uh, so anyway, getting back, no, getting back to the uh, study, all the gray boxes are to the right of the unity bar. Now there is an exception to this. If you use timed release iron or ferrosequels, that's iron surrounded by dioxyl sodium sulfosuccinate to protect the gut, there are far fewer gastrointestinal effects. But what there also is, is much less to no absorption to a degree that these frequently used formulations, ferrosequels and slow FE, are proscribed by brand in the textbook of hematology. So if you must use one of those two formulations, you might even consider telling the patient to put it directly into the toilet once or twice a day because you will get the same effect. Now, there's hope. Things are changing in the world of PO iron thanks to the wonderful work of Michael Zimmerman's group uh, on, the, on the measurement of hepcidin and iron absorption after dosing. What you can see here, if you take it once a day or twice a day, you get the same amount of iron. So there's actually a reason not to give it more than once a day, but there's even a better reason to give it every other day. And I will actually show you the graphs in a second. Here is a table of taking oral iron consecutively for 14 days or on alternate days for 28 days. And what you can see, the alternate day paradigm gives you a 30% increment in net iron absorbed with a 50%, not shown on this uh, table, decrement in side effects. 
Here's the reason. There is a change in plasma hepcidin after a single dose of oral iron. It peaks at about eight hours. It is elevated at 24, but not at 48. And the absorption of iron is inversely proportional to the rise of hepcidin. And here it is. <laughs> Total iron absorbed on alternate days is at least a third higher with significantly fewer side effects. But let's say it was exactly the same. It's still a home run for the alternate day paradigm because the toxicity is significantly reduced. So the conclusions of these three excellent studies, one in blood by Moretti, one in Stoffel, I'm sorry, one in Lancet Hematology by Stoffel, and one in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition by uh, 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 yoga, uh, all from Michael Zimmerman's group, mm -hmm. shows that large doses of iron trigger an acute hepcidin surge that reduces iron at 24 hours, but not at 48. And alternate day dosing increases absorption by 30 to 50 percent and reduces side effects. What I told you about the intravenous iron formulations is made sense sensible by this slide. This is a measurement of labile free iron, the cause of the infusion reaction, which once again, I'm going to show you. You can see that iron sucrose and ferric gluconate have a significantly higher amount of labile free iron, which triggers in a significant number of people complement, leading to an infusion reaction that consists of flushing and pressure in the chest. It is not anaphylaxis, it is tryptase negative. And these new formulations that I showed you just a few minutes ago have a markedly reduced amount of labile free iron, even low molecular weight iron dextran, uh, which can be given as a gram in in 45 to 60 minutes is significantly lower than the two iron salts, gluconate and sucrose. And it is for this reason that you can give a fairly large dose of a gram or even more in 15 to 60 minutes and not have any significant increment in adverse events. For iron safety, we have a marvelous meta-analysis published by Avni et al. after a not gafter Gavili's group from a not gafter Gavili's group in Israel. 103 trials were performed between 1965 and 2013. Over 10,000 patients were treated and compared to 4,000 patients with oral iron, 13 with no iron, 1,300 with no iron, 3,300 with placebo. And it almost makes my skin crawl to say this, but 155 with intramuscular iron. Now, if I can take an aside for a second. I am iron is painful. It permanently stains the buttock. It requires multiple injections. It has been published to be associated with gluteal sarcomas. It is not safer. It is not more effective. And it is not less expensive. And for that reason, it should not be given to anyone at any time, for any reason, anywhere on the planet. And otherwise, I have no opinion about that. Overall, there was no increase in the risk of serious adverse events compared to any comparator, including placebo. That does not mean there weren't infusion reactions, which I think now for the fifth time, I'm going to show you. There was no difference in efficacy among the formulations. Here is a forest plot that shows you the comparative safety. And this time, all of the boxes are to the right of the unity bar favoring safety. And this is an excellent paper in Mayo Clinic Proceedings in 2015. You have seen over the last few years, a series of papers that look at surrogates for anaphylaxis, surrogates like spontaneous adverse event reporting, Medicare coding, World Health Organization coding. They are 
specious. They provide obfuscation of the truth and the data because they cannot capture the nature of the minor reaction. I'm going to show you the results of a few of several head-to-head -head studies. Thousands of patients have been studied head-to-head. -head. Iron sucrose, deferic carboxymaltose, ferromoxetol, and ferric derisomaltose. Ferromoxetol to ferric carboxymaltose, derisomaltose to ferric carboxymaltose. Each of them compared to each other. And the, and the sine qua non for all of the studies is no difference. The fair one study was published in the American Journal of Hematology. It compared iron sucrose to iron isomaltoside. They had a blinded adjudication committee to look at the composite hypersensitivity reactions. They did not know who received what. And once, as I told you, no difference in hypersensitivity reaction between the two. The firm study was a very interesting study because it supports the use of a gram, but not more than a gram in a, in a single dose. Again, 2,000 patients, randomized, double blind, ferromoxetol to ferric carboxymaltose, performed in multiple countries around the world. Now, this may aggravate some of you. It certainly did me when we wrote the study, but 1,020 milligrams of ferromoxetol given as two 510 milligrams a week apart were compared to 1,500 of ferric carboxymaltose or 50% more. This was FDA mandated because those are the approved methodologies in the United States. But we got a very interesting conclusion. The primary endpoint of hypersensitivity reactions and severe hypersensitivity reactions was again assessed by a blinded adjudication committee. No difference, no difference at all, but fascinating. Look at these slides, 50% more of ferric carboxymaltose at five weeks resulted in a clinically insignificant difference of 0 0.24 grams per deciliter, suggesting that doses of more than a gram are wasteful. The phosphare study compared FCM to ferric derisomaltose. Again, FDA mandated a single infusion of a gram versus two infusions of ferric carboxymaltose. If this were done in Europe or Africa, it would be one infusion of ferric carboxymaltose because you have the more intelligent 500 or 1,000 milligram dose. Again, no difference. Here is a meta-analysis of all of the studies. You've all, all heard the term dextrin or non-dextrin containing uh, formulations. This shows you how inappropriate that term is. There is simply no difference. This is an un unadjusted 95%. What's the matter? All right, sorry. Now, this is what I've been telling you you're going to see. So let me tell you how we got this. We have a very large study in India right now. It's funded by the World Health Organization, Children's Investment Funds, the Gates Foundation, and the National Institutes of Health. It's a second trimester study of oral versus IV iron in pregnancy, looking at baby outcomes and uh, the incidence of preterm labor and small for gestational age babies. I was supposed to go to India to teach the doctors and nurses how to administer intravenous iron. And since I could not go because of COVID, Dr. Richard Derman, the Dean of Global Affairs at Thomas Jefferson University, paid a professional videographer to come to my office to film us giving IV iron. But whatever, for whatever reason, Lazarus flew into my office and gave me this wonderful video that I have been waiting for for so long. 
I'm cutting out all of the portions of the video that show how we mix the bag and how we turn the IV on. But you're about to see a minor infusion reaction called the Fishbang reaction, misinterpreted as anaphylaxis. And that misinterpretation is responsible for 99% of the ostensible serious adverse events attributed to IV iron um, around the world. This is my infusion center. We have about 7,200 square feet. We have 13 chairs. And you can see one of the nurses just giving intravenous iron um, to patients. This young girl, uh, a teenager, young woman, uh, 19 years old, had no risk factors, heavy uterine bleeding, uh, no multiple drug allergies, no asthma. You can see the IV iron hanging. We did not premedicate her as we do with everyone. We start slowly. She did not get methylprednisolone or ranitidine or famotidine, which is what we give to people who are at risk. And as you can see very slowly with observation, the intravenous iron is starting to go into her arm. That's her mother sitting there on the right. This is a standard bag with a standard infusion. We expected no issue. Now, this portion of my talk, these few seconds of delay, I, have, I guess I have to learn to say something intelligent during these few sections, but there's nothing to say, but here it is. Take a look at her. Look at her eyes. She's frightened. Look, her respiratory rate went up. Her face turned red. She's got pressure in the chest. She does not have wheezing. She does not have strider. She does not have periorbital edema, and she is not in shock. And this is not anaphylaxis. Now, I'm going to stop this for a second. Pretend you didn't know this. Pretend you went to school and learned intravenous iron was dangerous, because you did. And pretend you thought this is impending anaphylaxis because you would and pretend that you gave epinephrine and diphenhydramine because you would, which causes diaphoresis, hypotension, somnolence, tachycardia, shock, and ischemia. Who gets blamed? Not the epinephrine, not the Benadryl, but the iron. Now, watch what happens. What you're going to see takes place over three to five minutes. The infusion has been stopped. Fluids are being given. She will be premedicated with methylprednisolone and famotidine this time, but I must tell you, there's no prospective data that it makes a difference. I do it empirically because of a double blind study that showed <coughs> methylprednisolone eliminates um, the 24 hour uh, arthralgias and myalgias that often occur with IV iron. Look at her face. The redness is all gone. You can see in her eyes that the anxiety is gone. She's on her phone. Pretty soon you will see her smile and the lack of anxiety. But the real moral of the story is going to come in a few seconds. Here it is. Do you see the IV, the IV line in the back of the iron infusion? This young woman received the entire dose of the formulation that caused the reaction that I showed you. She did not end up going to the hospital with anaphylaxis. But if you use these specious surrogates, as has been done in a host of articles recently published, Medicare coding for interventions, you get a false sense of danger when indeed this is a minor self-limited reaction. So that's what I told you I would show you. Now quickly, we will go through disease states. Oral iron actually, I mean, oral iron actually makes inflammatory bowel disease worse. It has low absorption, limited efficacy, and it's directly toxic to the epithelium. And it is still standard in IBD, but it exacerbates intestinal inflammation and differentially affects bacterial communities in the me metabolic landscape, negatively altering the microbiome, which is so important to these patients with this miserable disorder. And so IV iron is probably specific 
um, in terms of the replacement iron formulation. Here you have ferrocarboxyl maltose in IBD patients. Let me tell you, you can take uh, iron dextran, ferromoxitol, or maltose, and these graphs are identical. But the key is IV iron was better at any part of the study, but more importantly, none of the gastrointestinal perturbation that's ubiquitous with oral iron. In bariatric surgery, in normal individuals, Iron has to be conjugated in the gut to vitamin C, amino acids, and sugars to make it uh, protected from the massive alkaline secretions in the proximal duodenum, which will otherwise convert it to the unabsorbable ferric, hydroxy uh, ferric hydroxide, and it ends up in stool. Um, bariatric surgeon surgery patients can't do that. Oral iron should be proscribed. It has no credible expectation of working. And here's a group of people who rerouted their gut to lose weight. They must be iron sufficient to maintain activities. Here's an excellent study from Geskire and Obesity Surgery in 2014 showing you the incidence of iron deficiency after bariatric surgery at five years, more than 70%. And these are people who were repleted with oral iron. I don't mean to be overly polemic, but I would say that makes it worthless. Here's a study that we just published um, in Obesity Surgery. Uh, looking at iron sucrose versus uh, ferric deriso maltose um, in, in the prospective study that I showed you earlier. And you can see that there is a significant benefit in terms of speed of reaction, but it's really less important. Both of these formulations worked. Both of them, take a look at the endpoints, resulted in significant increments in hemoglobin, serum ferritin and transferrin saturation. And the fact that ferric maltose did it faster is probably not clinically relevant, but the fact that it was able to do it with a single infusion compared to four to seven infusion makes it very relevant. In pregnancy, I think we have the biggest unmet clinical need. The guidelines differ. United States Preventative Services Task Force says there's insufficient evidence for routine screening for supplementation on preg on, at presentation in the absence of anemia. I will show you that that's in serious need of revisiting. The American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology Practice Bulletin says that intravenous iron is recommended if you can't tolerate or won't take moderate doses of oral iron. They have no recommendation for routine screening in non-anemic patients and oral iron is still recommended frontline in the third trimester. I heartily disagree. UK guidelines are a little better. Parenteral iron should be considered from the second trimester onward and all high-risk gravitas should be screened. I do agree. And in a marvelous paper in Blood by Chebby and Gafter Gavili, our most uh, prestigious hematology journal, intravenous iron for any oral intolerant second or third trimester patient and for second trimester gravitas with the hemoglobins less than 10 and all in the third. You do realize I'm talking about a significant paradigm shift in current guidelines. No PO iron in the third trimester. I'm going to show you why. In the non gravid state, the amount of iron you need is about the same as in the first trimester. But with the five to tenfold increment in iron needed for the developing fetus and the placenta, it is not credible to assume that there's going to be adequate absorption of a formulation that causes significant toxicity in over 70% um, and does not provide adequate iron to the developing fetus. Maternal iron deficiency, iron deficiency, not anemia, potentially affects fetal neonatal and childhood brain growth and development with adverse effects on myelination, neurotransmitters, and brain programming. And you can recognize this up to 19 years of age with cognitive function, memory, and even motor development. An iron deficiency in pregnancy has been associated with an increased risk of perinatal outcomes, including preterm death, preterm birth, low birth weight, and small for gestational age infants. In a prospective study of 2,400 women, Chow et al. showed that perinatal iron supplementation reduces maternal anemia. It does indeed, iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia. But 45% of the infants were 
<coughs> deficient at birth, I would like to remind you that we do not screen our infants for iron deficiency. We screen them for phenylketonuria, which we should, which occurs in one in 25,000, and you can prevent the neurologic damage that occurs with appropriate screening, but we do not screen for iron deficiency, which occurs at a level associated with measurable developmental defects in one in four. If that doesn't raise your hair, it should. Here is a graph given to me by Michael Georgiev, who was now head of the uh, Institute for the Developing Brain and former chief of neonatology at the University of Minnesota. You can see here in the purple box that if iron deficiency is not fixed in the mother, all of by two weeks postpartum, all of these abnormalities that I just spoke to you about remain and can be measured up to age 19. And let me just say it again, we don't screen our babies for iron deficiency. We are in our study and it is a primary endpoint. This is why there's, it's so important. Here are the baby's ferritins compared to the mother's. You can see the mother's do get better, but there is no significant increment in fetal ferritins with mothers who are supplemented with oral iron. This is disturbing. It needs to be addressed. It's an unmet clinical need, and it continues to date. <laughs> Infants who are at risk of neonatal iron deficiency or those from iron deficient mothers are previously treated for iron deficiency. Overweight, underweight, vegetarians, multips, IBD, HIV, or smokers, interpartum period of less than six months or a history of abnormal uterine bleeding, why don't we screen every presenting gravita? Here's data that says we should. This was a study I published in the Journal of Maternal and Fetal Medicine. We looked at 104 consecutive non-selected non-anemic. Can I say that again? Non-anemic presenting gravitas. 40, 42% were deficient based on serum ferritin, and TSAT or both. And you can see here, there's not even a difference in gravidity until you get to gravita four where the numbers go up significantly. A better study than mine just published in Blood Advances from Canada took a look at the prevalence of iron deficiency and screening. Only 45.6% were ever normal and only 30 0.2% were never iron deficient or insufficient. When iron deficiency screening is done, it occurs early. It affects greater than 50% of pregnancies in Canada. 25% are severe and 40% are completely missed. Does that bother you? It bothers me. Here is a study that looked at 299,000 mothers and their 566,000 offspring uh, in a Scandinavian group just published in the uh, uh, JAMA Psychiatry. Look at these figures. Iron anemia, mostly due to iron deficiency at any week of gestation, was associated with a statistically significant increment in spectrum, autism spectrum disorders. We don't screen non-anemic women. We don't. It's outrageous. You have treatment options. Oral iron works in the first trimester if tolerated, but 70% report significant distress. And the OBGYN literature says that the incidence of gastrointestinal side effects is un unacceptably high. Thousands and thousands and thousands of patients have been published with intravenous iron, not a single serious adverse event, not a single negative baby outcome. And yet the FDA and the European medical societies, uh, uh, European medicines agencies say that we need to monitor with fetal monitoring, we're giving IV iron, and that fetal death is a class complication of intravenous iron. I actually had a uh, conference call with FDA about this, and there statement, completely reflective of their ignorance of the safety and administration of intravenous iron, said, well, IV iron can cause anaphylaxis, and anaphylaxis can cause fetal demise. I would like to remind you that penicillin can cause anaphylaxis, and yet penicillin doesn't carry 
that horrible warning. Can you imagine getting consent from a mother and say, here, we're going to fix, fix your iron deficiency, but your baby could die. That's really going to be a selling point, isn't it? There was no reason for these irresponsible labelings. So what did I tell you today? I think these data support the convenience and safety of giving iron in a single setting. It should be administered as soon as there is intolerance. It should be given whenever it's known to be ineffective, like bariatric surgery and inflammatory bowel disease. And it should be administered if the hemoglobin is less than 10 in the second trimester and to everyone in the third. All pregnant women should be screened. It's irresponsible not to do it. All newborns should be screened. It's irresponsible not to do it. And compared with oral iron, IV iron has fewer side effects, is virtually always effective. It has 100% adherence because you cannot give it back once it's given. And these data really do call for large prospective studies, which is what we are doing to compare IV and oral, uh, and oral iron for the therapy of maternal iron deficiency anemia. And I am finished. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for listening. I'm all done. Dr. Arbel, we thank you for that very uh, engaging talk. And again, in light of the fact that you, though not maybe feeling the best, you still put forth the effort to be here with us. And we greatly appreciate your knowledge and expertise. Um, you did bring some um, ethical, really, and moral issues to the point in terms of how women are treated in society, um, in terms of looking at the level of hemoglobin, what they consider um, adequate for us, as well as the fact of why aren't we screening every pregnant woman for, my, for iron deficiency in light of the um, deleterious effects for the neonate as well as the mom. So thank you again very much for that very um, enlightening um, session. So right now we're going to, um, before I go on, I do want to um, notify the audience that unfortunately, uh, Dr. Ward has had an uh, unexpected emergency which is why he's not joining us today. And we wish um, him well and that the emergency is resolved expeditiously. So right now we're gonna start opening up our Q&A session. We see that many of you have um, entered some questions into the chat. We'll try to get to as many as we can. And for those that are not answered, the speakers will answer them um, via the chat, or we will try to get the answer to you afterwards to the best of our ability. So um, with our title being um, Bloodless Medicine Education, it's a game changer. Already we see that some are effect, uh, impacted by that and see the need for that. Someone um, posed a question to our conference chair, Mr. Simeon Tuwe. They want to know, is it possible to include bloodless medicine in the current curriculum for medical students in Zambia? Is that a possibility, something that's being looked at? It, it is a possibility. We need to present it to the Zambia Medical Association and then present it to, to, to the ministry, to the, to the university. It's something we're still working in the background. Very good. Keep us apprised of the progress that's being made in that regard. I will do that. Thank you. Great. Another question. Someone wanted to know how about anemia before surgery? How do we treat it? Any takers for that question? Any of our panelists? Primarily to Dr. Arbach. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, if it's elective surgery, we try very hard to use intravenous iron and or an erythropoiesis stimulating agent to get the hemoglobin at least above 10. And as Dr. Shander has taught me, for surgeries that are associated with significant blood loss uh, up to 13 to decrease the likelihood of a blood transfusion. Okay, thank you very much. There's another question for you, Dr. Arbar. Someone wrote that they were fascinated by hepcidin and its actions, especially in anemia of inflammation. Can you see a point at which we will get, to get drugs to suppress hepcidin or rely on ESAs to do this? Well, I think they're on their way, but 
truth of the matter is hepcidin causes iron-restricted erythropoiesis. And you can bang your head against the wall with ESAs and get very, very minimal benefit. It's intravenous iron that overcomes the hepcidin deficit. Now, I'm going to take a second to explain why. I don't have in vitro data for this, but Clara Camaskella, that giant in iron biology from Milan, taught me this. When you give IV iron, it's picked up by circulating macrophages, and it raises what are called iron regulatory proteins. These proteins in their, therein upregulate ferroportin which is how hepcidin works. Hepcidin blocks ferroportin, the export protein of IV iron. And IV iron can overcome that block and oral iron can't uh, because enough doesn't get into the cell because of absorption. Now, while I don't have in vitro data to support it, the giant decrements in ESA is necessary to achieve target hemoglobins in, in renal failure and chemotherapy induced anemia certainly support that mechanism. but. Hepcidin antagonists are on their way. Um, they're being developed now. I don't. I think they're going to be brutally expensive, and they're probably unnecessary because intravenous iron and ESAs will overcome most of the hepcidin block. Thank you for that that response, uh, Dr. Lobel, who's one of our panelists. Can you please comment on uh, Dr. Shannon's presentation? You're muted. Apologize. Um, no, thank you. Yes, of course. Uh, I've worked with Dr. Shander for 25 years, long before my uh, time started here at, at Englewood. Um, and when I was in my training, I would hear advertisements and information about Englewood and things that they were doing back in the mid 90s. Um, and, you know, again, as we've talked about, the entire title of this talk is about education. Um, and I will say, you know, I think uh, as people have stated back then and even today, the education that we receive, whether in medical school or our training after medical school, is still not uh, focused on this, on this area. Um, obviously, we have a program at Englewood. So we try and educate all new providers because we know many providers come to Englewood and have not, you know, they may hear about it just like I did, but yet didn't receive the education. Um, I think the interesting thing about Dr. Shander's talk um, is really about, you know, which education is needed more, the education about patient blood management or the education really about the ethical and moral dilemmas that so many people in medicine seem to be more concerned about, uh, which I find, you know, challenging because that's another area that I, I don't think many of us are, are very well educated, which is, uh, you know, the ethics and, and moral situations that we face in our everyday uh, practices. Thank you very much for, for your comments. Thank you very, very much. Um, Dr. Alpac will be back in a few minutes to address some more questions. So maybe um, a couple of ha uh, housekeeping questions. Uh, someone wanted to know how they could get a certificate to renew their pen. Maybe um, Nathaniel, could you address that? Uh, you said how to get what, please? A certificate, their certificate to renew their pen. Okay, so please, all um, requests for certificates, slides, uh, whatever, should be sent to info at BMS Society and they will be attended to. Okay. Um. Seems like the majority of our questions have to do with iron. Um, more questions for Dr. Arbaugh. Um, oh, you're back. Okay, great. So our next question for you, Dr. Arbaugh. Even though local hospitals are very good at addressing iron deficiency, they put low ferritin, um, less than 100, despite uh, hemoglobin being stable or slightly low in pregnancy, 
How do you address the disparity at a midwife level in the community? Um, this person relates that even recently a lady was told that their ferritin could be lower than the, the normal is around 30. This patient's ferritin level was 18. Well, I'd like to disagree with the beginning of the question because it's not a disparity with midwives. It's a disparity with practitioners in obstetrics and gynecology. This is a neglected issue in obstetrics around the world. We don't check for it. We use numbers that are too low and we don't intervene with treatments that work. There is a huge need for massive re-education on how to deal with this. I think that a bunch of papers are going to come out in the next year or two supporting these recommendations. And the real home run is going to be the baby outcomes. Will we see a significant difference in neonatal iron sufficiency? We really need to change our thinking from postpartum iron repletion to intranatal iron sufficiency. And the only way that can be achieved is to ensure that the pregnant mother is iron sufficient prior to the baby being born. Okay. Another question for you, Dr. Arbuck, should iron or specifically IV iron be given to patients with sickle cell hemolysis? <coughs> um, probably. They have elevated hepcidin because of the ongoing uh, inflammatory reactions caused by the hemolysis and the other morbidities of sickle cell. But I need to warn you, you do not give sickle cell patients, patients with sickle cell anemia, iron unless they have documented iron deficiency. You don't treat hemolysis with IV iron. You treat iron deficiency with IV iron and hemolysis needs to be treated with targeted therapy specific to the sickle cell disease, excuse me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I do treat sickle cell patients with iron deficiency with IV iron, but I prove they're iron deficient beforehand. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So Dr. Roland Doma Igba, a professor at the, uni the university, um, the Surgery University in Calabar, the teaching hospital there in Nigeria. Could you um, make any comments for us on um, any of the presentations? You're muted, sir. you're muted, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for asking me. Um, it's a privilege and an honor actually to listen to both presentations. I, I was the chair when Professor Shanda gave his first lecture. Uh, both have been spectacular lectures and in promotion of um, education in bloodless medicine and surgery. I, I believe that that is the key, especially in our environment, uh, which I mean all of Africa, West Africa, specifically, and Nigeria. Um, the resistance to bloodless medicine and surgery is mainly out of ignorance. And except the movement is able to create um, uh, a platform for regular education, re-education, seminars, workshops, where there is practical presentation of the various ways that uh, this process can be done, uh, then we need to catch on. I, I believe that right now, BMS is still something of the future in our environment because there are so few persons who have adequate knowledge of both the science of the subject and the practical clinical application of the processes. I have just done some surgery with an anemic uh, patient uh, 
with the help of bloodless medicine and surgery, I invited the team and they went through the operation with me and post-operatively continued that the patient has come out very well at the end. I believe that is the way forward with more and more education. Regarding the presentation by Dr. Oba, not only is the subject, but the manner of presentation is most welcoming and challenging. And I think he has succeeded in generating enough interest and enthusiasm in the practice of treatment of anemias with iron. Uh, I think uh, they are groundbreaking presentations. And I want to congratulate them very much on the amount of education they have exposed all of us to this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. We're also um, uh, privileged to have among us uh, Dr. Art, Bra Art Bracey. He's a past president for the Society for the Advancement of Blood Management. Dr. Bracey, can you share a few comments with us, please? Dr. Bracey? Okay. Well, while we're waiting for Dr. Bracey, uh, Dr. Shander, do you have any examples of new consent and declination for transfusion that would address some of the current views? Dr. Shander? Okay. Well, we'll go back to another question for Dr. Arbach in the interim. Um, is uh, the iron release due to hemolysis available for utilization? Yes, it is. Um, but it's better to turn off the hemolysis. Um, uh, okay. The iron is immediately released into the blood. It's picked up by whatever transferrin is available and will probably supersaturate transferrin in a short period of time. By the way, iron in transfused blood is not available and usually ends up in the reticuloendothelial system. Okay, thank you so much. So Dr. Shander, there was a question. We wanted to know if you had any examples of a new consent and declination for transfusion that would address some of the current views. So uh, again, as I mentioned in the talk, I, um, we don't have the complete form yet. Uh, it is being worked on. And as soon as we have it, we'll provide it uh, uh, to everyone who wants it. So we'll provide it to you and we could circulate that. So we're still, we're still building the language uh, to, be, um, uh, to be accurate at this point. Okay. Um, one of our other panelists, Mary Jane Michaels. Mary Jane, can you um, give us a few comments? Thank you for joining us today. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I've really enjoyed this and it has really sparked some um, new thoughts um, from Dr. Shander. I was the one that asked the question about the consent form um, because we are actually revisiting that in our hospital at the University of Florida. And so um, as soon as you complete that, I'd really like a copy um, of that consent form. And also with the anemia management, we are also getting our anemia clinic up and running again. And so I was also very interested in your presentation as well, Dr. Arbach. So um, thank you for those comments. And I really like the approach to um, bloodless medicine. I feel like Often we've provided all those examples of um, interventions to use during surgery, but often we really haven't looked at the educational components of blood and what it actually does in the body. So I think that that's one of the things that perhaps will change our educational approach and um, look at some of those understandings of the basic principles. So. 
I really appreciate these um, conferences and I, I really hope that they continue in the future. Hey, great to see you, Mary Jane. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you everyone for attending this morning session. Um, this is the end of the session. I would like to extend again a huge thank you to our wonderful speakers, Drs. Auerbach and um, Shander, as well as my co-moderator, Sharon Sledge, and of course, our conference chairman, Dr. Orsoro, and also Dr. Simuto. Um, we'll now move on to the next session, which includes the, some abstracts. So I'm going to introduce the moderators of this session, Professor Nagim and Rebecca Rock. Take it away. Hello, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for attending today and thank you for those excellent presentations earlier. Um, we are going to be having four oral abstract presentations and so we will be having them do approximately 10 minutes maximum of presentation with some time afterwards for question and answer. So if you would like, please type your question in the Q&A box at, during each session or at the end of each session and we will do our best to answer them all. So thank you for the introduction. My name is Becky Rock, and I am the nurse clinician who coordinates the patient blood management program in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And I'm pleased to co-moderate with Professor Nagim Nagim, who is a professor of orthopedics at the University of Calabar in Calabar, Nigeria. And so Professor Nagim is going to begin our introductions. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for attending this conference. Uh, welcome to this segment of the program for this uh, afternoon. And I welcome my co-moderator of this segment as well, and the panelists, as well as the after presenters. So we can kick off right away. And um, the first abstract is to be presented by Dr. Ote. Ote. And the topic is free cleft palate surgeries by Smile Train. Experience in two centers that practice bonus surgery and the use of allogenic blood transfusion respectively. You have 10 minutes to present, please. Carry on, sir. Dr. Ote, you are on. We can't hear you. He's muted. Unmute yourself and speak, Dr. Ote. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to present my experience. Please can the administrator share my slides. Oh, uh, sorry, I think you were to share them. Are you able to share them? Uh, Dr. Tay, are you able to share your slides? Sorry, I am unable to share those slides. I thought you okay. shared the slides. No, no problem. We'll, 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 turn, we'll um, open your slides in a moment. You can bring down your camera a bit because it's like cutting off part of your face. That's better. So um, I think we are, your slides are open now. I'm just going to try to share them. All right, thank you very much. Uh, this is the topic, uh, free cleft palate surgeries by Smile Train, experience in two centers that practice bloodless surgery and use of allogenic blood respectively. Please can you go on? 
Next slide, please. Smile Train is a non-governmental organization that is based in New York. Can we go to the next slide? Yes. Based in New York. And um, the, the, this organization uh, prepares clear lip and palate free of charge throughout the world. And we know that clear palate surgery occur in a small cavity, the mouth or the oral cavity. There is usually significant bleeding during cleft palate surgery because of the fact that the head and neck are well perfused and then uh, uh, it's in a small cavity. The teaching in the medical schools used to be that blood should be grouped and cross matched before this surgery. Next slide, please. This study is a retrospective um, study. A single surgeon operated in one center for 12 years between 2011 and 2022. Patients were optimized with Martinix before surgery in this center. No blood transfusion was given after surgery or even before surgery. The number of patients seen in this first center were 63 patients. In the second center, the surgeon operated for two years, 2021 and 2022. Um, let's please, next slide. This second center gave allogenous blood, allogenic blood to some patients after surgery. The number of patients operated were just 13 in these two years. The case notes were taken from the two centers. The age, the addresses, uh, complications were recorded. Next slide. 63 patients results. 63 patients had clear palate repair at the bloodless center. There were five wound failures in form of fistula or total wound breakdown in the first eight years. There was no wound breakdown in the last four years in the first center. The 13, the 13 patients that had cleft palate repair in the center that transfused some patients, that there were 13 patients in that center. Go on, please. In this center, there was no wound failure, but there was one mortality in the second center that uh, gives blood to some patients after surgery. There were wound failures in the bloodless center in the first eight years of surgeries. This may be due to inadequate experience by the surgeon at the beginning of the program. There were no wound failures in the same center in the last four years after the surgeon had acquired experience. There was no wound failure in the center that transfused blood to some patients after surgery. This of course may be due to the experience acquired in the eight years before starting surgeries in this center. There was one mortality in this center in the immediate post-operative period, which may be due to anesthetic, surgical, or blood complications. We cannot speculate because uh, we were not allowed um, post-mortem. In conclusion, um, allogenic blood transfusion after clear palate surgery may not give a better outcome. A long learning curve is necessary for good outcome of cleft palate surgery. Thank you. Hello, thank you, Dr. Questions, Anna. Hello? Yes. Yeah, thank you for the presentation and also for keeping the time. The floor is now open for questions. 
and comment from the participants, please. Well, in the absence of any question, maybe Becky, you can move on to the next presentation. Absolutely. So our uh, second uh, abstract that's being presented is submitted by uh, Cassandra Upchurch and Dr. Nathaniel Usoro, and it's entitled The Necessity of Bloodless Medicine for Blood Transfusion Avoidance During a Global Pandemic. Uh, either Cassandra or Nathaniel, please uh, go ahead. That would be Cassandra. I'm here, sorry, just trying to trying to share. <laughs> One second. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yeah, we can. Oh, okay, one second. It just disappeared. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll be back shortly. Okay, so our abstract was on the necessity of bloodless medicine uh, for blood transfusion avoidance during a global pandemic. And so um, this abstract was written by myself and Dr. Yusuro um, at the top of the uh, pandemic as a result of discussing bloodless medicine as a solution to the current blood shortage and issues uh, that we currently have. Uh, with uh, blood storage, um, blood donation, and also managing patients without the use of blood transfusions. And so our goal of the abstract was to identify challenges of blood management in the pandemic and how bloodless medicine could provide a solution. And so we do know that uh, bloodless medicine uh, with these patients is a very uh, unique or subset of patients that uh, do not consent to blood transfusions under any circumstances. And of course, from this group, we learned that it has uh, larger or uh, ben benefits for the greater population. And so we do know that with those individuals that do consent to blood transfusions, the uh, optimal or the ideal standard would be uh, the use of patient blood management, even though bloodless management falls under this umbrella. Um, but again, it's a solution and allocated resources appropriately in ensuring that uh, we do provide the necessary uh, education around um, the utilization of blood, but also try to avoid blood transfusions at any cost. And so we looked at a non-systematic -system, uh, review of literature that was carried out to identify the challenges of blood management to COVID-19, as well as blood medicine techniques that can mitigate the challenges because of course COVID uh, posed many challenges um, and there were already challenges that existed prior to COVID as far as blood banking. And so <clears throat> we all know the risk associated with uh, and complications associated with blood transfusions in general. So we do have known and unknown risk, um, but unique challenges uh, posed um, an issue during COVID. And that of course, now we have this emergence of a new pathogen. And so of course, unknown pathogens, how would affect the blood supply, patients and donation as far as uh, protocols that would be implemented to screen patients uh, safely and implement CDC guidelines as well. And so that had a significant impact. 
in the supply as well. Um, but we also talk about the fact that during that time, again, for individuals that did accept or consent to blood transfusions and for blood banking, there were limited donation centers and canceled donation events, decreased donors and known complications with transfusion. And so they really had to implement, um, <clears throat> the, the literature shows that they really had to in implement policies to ensure that blood was allocated appropriately. And so with that being said, it was ideal that to have optimal outcome for patients, that blood transfusions be avoided uh, to uh, ensure that patients had successful outcomes. And we talk about um, the impact of COVID-19 during current blood supply. Um, most hospitals benefited greatly from avoiding it in a sense that um, they needed to really screen uh, which patients, as far as ones that consented to blood, received these blood transfusions, and if these, uh, if it, and if when it was being used, it was being used discriminately, and that it was used for patients that were consenting, and it wasn't just given arbitrarily based on a number. Um, but more importantly, these strategies that are used for bloodless medicine, when we talk about the four pillars that we'll get into, uh, really helped us to see that it had a greater impact for the population overall. And so are we really evaluating who's really needing blood? And so we do know prior to the pandemic, there was already an issue with blood banking in that there were about 100 million transfusions done globally each year. And, um, and now we have these unique issues that present themselves during COVID. So of course, even patients that do, as we stated before, consent, consented to blood, we really needed to think about, did it really make sense to give blood? We really started looking at, the literature really started to look at um, is it really safe to, and is it the best practice? And so even in a community, I look at the fact that it was really being encouraged, especially uh, with the Stop the Bleed campaign uh, for even individuals in emergency or trauma situations in the community um, to learn um, techniques to promote conservation of blood and stop the bleeding. And so that's a campaign that's also encouraged uh, in helping people to understand how to control it safely, especially in emergency situations and in the community as well. In setting. And so we talked about limited resources. So again, um, even when collecting but one of the issues that took place, in addition to canceled event, um, staffing um, and protocols that really delayed uh, that component, um, the other piece is limited resources. So even with apheresis, uh, that was something that, that was something that was severely limited. And so it really brought to light the need to implement uh, the four pillars and strategies in bloodless medicine to avoid the use of blood, even in individuals that consented to blood. And so the goal really was to optimize stewardship of blood. So even in those populations, really, again, screening with protocols and implementing a good program, a PBM program, or blood program to avoid blood transfusions, but also only use blood in those population if the doctor deemed it necessary. But again, the goal is to avoid transfusion overall. And so we talk about bloodless medicine pillars, techniques that are grouped under four pillars. And so the literature highlights that um, the four pillars are raising hematocrit, minimizing blood loss, optimi optimizing tissue oxygenation, and supporting patient intolerance of anemia. And so what we learned also, and what we're seeing uh, across the board in literature is that the multimodal, multidisciplinary manner following a protocol, typically when these protocols are implemented, when we do change practice, um, bloodless medicine has been a successful solution uh, to this issue, especially in a time of a crisis such as uh, COVID-19 impact in the blood supply. And so collectively, the literature shows that uh, a combination of about 10 hospitals showed a variation of benefits. Um, and so there were a long list of benefits uh, in avoiding blood transfusion, especially during COVID-19. And so you saw a decrease in transfusion, mortality, average length of stay, reoperation, readmissions, complications, and cost. Uh, which is that the programs and these protocols needed to be implemented and blood transfusions can be avoided. Um, and we need to put protocols and strategies in place to do so appropriately. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cassandra. So we will open uh, the, the platform for questions. If you have any questions, you can certainly add those to the chat. Um, I'm wondering if I can add a question right now um, while I've got the chance. And um, and I think that there may be some others uh, within our panelists who might be able to uh, speak to this as well. And I'm thinking of Dr. Shander being one of the authors of the, the urgent need to implement PBM during a global pandemic. 
Um, we know that we're not out of the woods with this current pandemic and certainly with others coming up that certainly could be on the horizon in the future. Um, with what the WHO has already um, promoted in terms of um, the urgent need to implement PBM, um, who has the biggest opportunity to promote PBM, bloodless medicine and surgery in, in the face of, of how to support patients during a pandemic? Um, is, is it, are we not hearing enough from those who really could have an impact here? I'd love to hear your opinions and that of uh, those who were behind that um, that um, that urgent need to implement PBM. I'm sorry, Becky, I didn't quite get the question. The, the, sorry, my apologies. So the question is, so we've had the WHO and, um, and others talk about the urgent need to implement patient blood management but to further advance bloodless medicine and surgery. Um, I'm wondering um, either Cassandra or Dr. Soro or anybody else of our panelists, can anybody offer any thoughts on who within the world really can have the biggest impact in promoting bloodless medicine and surgery in order to support patients? Um, is it a specific global organization? Is it um, far beyond, like within our individual countries and health organizations, should we be seeing more action from leadership there? Um, who can really help make the biggest difference in promoting bloodless medicine and surgery in a pandemic? So, uh, in or out of pandemic, I think we all have a share in uh, promoting bloodless medicine and surgery. Uh, right where we are now in the bloodless medicine and surgery society i think we we probably at this time have the lion's share because we are the only society in the world that is committed to uh, bloodless care and we are not promoting it not just for patients who decline uh, for whatever reason we are promoting superior way for better outcomes uh, that is what the literature says. So we want to go with what the literature says. So uh, what you're doing right now, Becky, is very important uh, work in uh, publicizing that image. And um, people are observing the results, like in my center, people are looking at it. When we start, six of us. But as people observe the results, I mean, you have like, almost entire departments are members of the best medicine and surgery group. So um, we, in our individual centers, we do have to, first of all, convince ourselves that it's a better way of caring for patients. And as we apply those um, methods, and we bring in people, let them observe in, in very, I mean, it's a multidisciplinary practice. So even those who, don't normally work with us. Whenever we have the opportunity, we can bring them in so that indirectly they become observers. And uh, so as time goes on, okay, right now there's a, um, a PBM committee meeting going on in Australia of the World Health Organization. And some members of that committee are also members of the Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Society. So um, they have a chance to put in a word for us in the WHO. In any case, what is PBM? PBM is just an attempt to make bloodless medicine and surgery more acceptable to everyone. So it, it should be, uh, bloodless is the ultimate destination. I'm sorry if I'm being too worried. Let me stop there. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any other questions? Um, you can please add them in the chat. Um, Otherwise, I think perhaps uh, we'll ask Professor Nagim to introduce uh, our third abstract. Yeah, uh, thank you, Becky. Um, the next uh, abstract. The next abstract was presented by Dr. So Nathaniel. It looks like Professor, Professor Ndumai Bas hand was up. Oh, really? Okay, please, Prof, you can speak. I didn't see it. You're muted, sir. 
myself. Uh, thank you very much. The question she asked was very relevant. I, in as much as uh, individual centers can do so much to promote bloodless medicine and surgery, the WHO as a key medical organ that covers the whole universe can be the active agent that could promote this um, futuristic approach to medical practice by ensuring that there is a WHO committee raised on it. Uh, that committee will now uh, move to make sure medical schools and co include bloodless medicine in their curriculum, and then uh, give various opportunities for people to train in various centers of the world in bloodless medicine and surgery. I think that's one of the fastest ways to make sure that uh, it soon becomes a worldwide accepted practice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof, for your comments. You. I think we can go on now to the next uh, abstract presentation. Uh, it's, it's entitled, Stimulated Frequencies Safe and Cost-Effective, a case report. Be taken by Dr. Chima Obi Isi Guzo. Dr. Isi Guzo, you have the floor. Yeah, how effective is stimulated electrical process in post op anemia? This report. These are the authors. Uh, we don't have any disclosure. It needs to be a common medical problem that can sometimes be managing, uh, difficult to manage if one lacks the training or education in hemoglobin optimization. Uh, these are actually the three main pillars, but the focus of this presentation is on the first, and that is stimulating blood production in the face of anemia. Uh, we know that uh, simulated process is aimed at uh, increasing the red cell mass. And it is done by harnessing a natural process, only that it is expedited, uh, that's erythropoiesis. Uh, the use of uh, iron and erythropoietin uh, have been uh, effective in achieving this stimulation. Erythropoietin already uh, as recommended for use in anemia uh, imperial patients and those who are critically ill. Uh, it's usually in that. Uh, oh, my apologies. Sure. Sorry to interrupt, but um, are you able to put your slides onto slideshow mode? Um, they're not advancing as you're talking right now. Sorry? Your, your slides, are you able to put your presentation onto slideshow mode? Okay, slideshow. Um, yeah, so you should it's see. It's already uh, on slideshow. Yeah, it's just showing your first slide right now, and it's not um, doing the presentation for you. So if you see up on the the top bar, okay, just, you should have okay, the hold. option slideshow. That and uh, let me get back to the key. sure. If you try that again. <clears throat> Okay, and right. so then within here, if you see um, up on the top bar along home insert design animations, you've got slideshow. Okay, Okay. 
Can I try to share from here for you? Okay. That might that be a be good best. idea. Yeah. There we go. Thank you so much. Sorry for the interruption. Now we're good. Um, can I move on to the next slide? Next slide, okay. Yeah, anemia, as you know, is a common medical problem. And uh, it can be difficult to manage if one does not have the training or the education on how to optimize the mobility. Next slide. Uh, these are the principles of uh, hemoglobin optimization. Uh, stimulated erythropoiesis uh, focuses on the, one of the pillars that is highlighted in red, and that is stimulation of blood production. Next slide. Yeah, the aim of uh, simulated electroplasty at the SE is to increase the red cell mass. And that is achieved by harnessing a natural process of erythropoiesis. erythropoiesis. Iron and erythropoietin uh, play a role in achieving this aim. Uh, erythropoietin already is uh, recommended for use for anemia in period patients and those who are critically ill. Uh, the aim is to uh, initiate build up of the hemoglobin if you know that in anemia it could be due to absolute deficiency, which is true depletion, or functional deficiency in iron, which is due to poor uh, bioavailability. Yeah, this is a case report of uh, two patients in the Federal Medical Center where is a tertiary health center in the start is Nigeria. And currently who a blood medicine and surgery with uh, Danny Bloodless Care. Next, next slide. Yeah, the first case is uh, a female. A uh, 27 year old is a teacher uh, that presented uh, with fever, cough, and tachypnea of three days duration. Uh, these symptoms came up 23 days after she had a lower segment uh, cesarean section. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, on examination, it uh, showed a young woman that was severely pale uh, with features of respiratory distress uh, with a cycle, respiratory cycle of 72 cycles per minute. The pulse rate was 120 beats per minute and the BP was 120 over 60 millimeters mercury. The chest was clear. The abdomen was found to be distended with a patomegaly uh, that is 10 cm below the coastal margin. A general examination showed that uh, it closed us. Uh, the uterus was bulky, there were no exam masses, and there was no tenderness. The impression at presentation was anemic heart failure, complicated by severe malaria, but they queried sepsis as well. Next slide. The uh, investigations were quickly uh, done, and it turned out to, that the PCV was 12%. That's four grams per day. There are also abnormalities noticed in the serum electrolyte urea and creatinine uh, profile. Uh, there was raised urea, raised creatinine. She was acidotic. Then the liver function test also showed derailment in total bilirubin and uh, B surface antigen negative, 
and hepatitis C. So, uh, make, sorry, re, not reactive as well. Then a full blood count was also done, and it showed a raised Y cell, total Y cell count of 17.7 with a dominant neutrophilia. Um, next, then the ESR was also high, about 150 millimeters mercury, sorry, 150 millimeters per hour. Uh, the next slide. Um, a consult was sent to other uh, uh, special. The patient uh, declined blood transfusion because of her fate and, uh, and its primary components. So uh, the blood lead medicine and surgery group was also alerted about the situation. Uh, they made an impression of anemic card failure with azotemia secondary to sepsis. The hematologist also reviewed, um, made an impression of severe anemia secondary to acute kidney injury following sepsis. When we came in, we had a meeting with the group, with the managing unit and these other con uh, units that were consulted. And a treatment plan was drawn up. Next slide. Uh, the plan was to use a stimulated erythropoiesis uh, antibiotic therapy was commenced. We started with the independence and later the escalated to the, uh, uh, the malaria with the uh, ACT artemisinin combi based combination therapy. Oxygen therapy was also instituted to optimize saturation and the dietitian was also involved to optimize our nutrition. The next slide. The iron deficiency was deficit was calculated based on using the Ponzani formula. It came down to 1,200 milligrams of elemental iron. We prefer to use iron sucrose because of uh, the profile with reactions. And uh, we delivered the iron in six doses, 200 milligrams in 200 mils of normal saline. And we started off with a high dose of erythropoietin of 40,000 international units. That was uh, Units twice weekly, and she got about five doses. We supplemented with vitamin C, zinc, multivitamin, vitamin D, and uh, folic acid as supplements. Uh, next slide. Uh, after the second dose of iron sucrose, uh, she had a mild reaction going by Dr. Albach's presentation. And the reaction and she told us to pre-medicate. Sorry, the slides are out. So, sorry, it seems I lost connection there. Okay. Um, so that means the screen, screen sharing is off. Let me see, I'll get you back. Okay. Uh, one second. Okay, got That's where you were. Yes. So following the re reaction to the second dose of iron sucrose, we had we invited a hematologist and she recommended a pre-medication with uh, IV promethazine and IV hydrocortisone. And that took care of the problem. The rest of the doses we are given with this pre-medication and it went well. We closely observed that and monitored her during the administration. Next slide. Notice that there was a stabilization of most of our symptoms. The pulse rate came down to 94 beats per minute. The respiratory rate of slide. Like... 
on the eighth day, uh, the uh, renal panel also started normalizing. If you look at some of the parameters, the urea, the creatinine, they all came down. Then the acidosis we also had at the beginning also started uh, resolving. At least we had beta value of 80 millimoles per liter. By the 13th day, we noticed that there was a rise in the hemoglobin to about 6.8 grams. And uh, the neutrophilia was also down. The Y cell count was all, has come down almost to normal. And there was much improvement generally uh, in the additional uh, depression. The next slide. Uh, by the 18th day, the PCV was 29%. That's 9.7 gram, grams per DL. The renal uh, parameters and the blood uh, features had all normalized. And uh, she was discharged home without use of allogenic uh, transfusion. The next slide. Okay, next slide. The second patient uh, is also a female, 36 years old, who presented with preeclampsia at 37 weeks of gestation. She had a, the preeclampsia was a severe one. She had an emergency zero section and subtotal hysterectomy. She had a hysterectomy because she started having postpartum hemorrhage on table due to uterine atony. Every attempt to stop it on table or approve the body, um, she had a hysterectomy and came out with a post-stop hemoglobin of 6.9 grams per day. She declined her, her blood transfusion because of her religious belief as a Jehovah's witness. Next slide. Uh, the, they invited the bloodless medicine and surgery group. Uh, we uh, put her on a, a plan for stimulated erythropoiesis. We started her off on um, 36,000 international units of uh, erythropoiesis. Then followed up with 20,000 every three days. She got about four doses. We calculated the iron deficit and it came to her around 1.544 milligrams of elemental iron. And we delivered that over eight doses. She had other supplements as listed below. Uh, we had her stop oral iron since we were giving parenteral iron. She was discharged by the 15 day post stop with a HB of uh, 9.3 grams. Uh, but interesting thing about this patient was that 10 day post stop she was up and about to the point that everybody got worried. In fact, a woman in the same world with her that received two units of blood and wasn't getting out of bed, bed told her surgeons to stop that she wouldn't take any other blood, that they should give her whatever we've done for this other patient. Uh, and uh, we were not invited anyway by the units, but her comments were well taken. Next slide. The outcomes for both patients were satisfactory. Uh, the, patients have been, the, the patients have been followed up for three months and they had rising health of disease and the person. The next slide. Yeah, managing anemia with uh, allogenic, without allogenic blood transfusion is possible in various situations. A multidisciplinary approach is clearly advocated and stimulated erythropoiesis is a viable option that can be used by clinicians. Uh, we know EPO, especially, in, uh, has been found to be tissue protective in the face of tissue host response in sepsis. So, issues may have another layer of advantage in addition to uh, uh, helping in stimulated erythropoiesis. I do short-term erythropoietin regimen is most preferred in our own situation, and that worked out well in two, in the two cases we managed. The cost is cheaper when you compare with the risk of allogenic transfusions. Next slide. So we one thing we try to we try to do in these cases is to in, make sure that our interaction with other specialties uh, ended up having them educated 
In fact, we noticed that in these last two cases, they got involved in what we were doing. They were helping us to deliver the drugs at the right time and also in monitoring this patient. And they were quick to invite us anytime there, were, there was an issue. Then we also discovered that getting them involved and educating them increase, encourages demystification of the usefulness of stimulated electrophoresis. In the recent times, we are getting more invitations from other units who have challenges with patients uh, that are presenting with anemia. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Izikuzo, for the interesting presentation. Those two very interesting cases that you brought to our, uh, presented to us. Um, the floor is now open for questions. You may write your questions on the chat section of the platform. It seems there are still no questions. No questions for Dr. Isiguzo. We thank you again for the presentation. Becky, can you take over the last, present, the last uh, introduction? All right, thank you. So our uh, final abstract today is entitled Bloodless Surgery for a Huge Goiter, Respecting Patient Autonomy, a Case Report. Um, this was submitted by Drs. Nathaniel Osoro, Ote Ote, Queeneth Kalu, and Ofinume Isiam. And uh, so I'm not sure who is presenting, but I'll ask you to go ahead and uh, take it away. Thank you, Becky. So uh, on behalf of my colleagues, uh, we do not have any disclosures, and we need to mention that the patients gave us written permission to share this information and also the pictures. So you notice here that autonomy is number one among the pillars of surgical ethics. Patient has free and uh, action when making decisions regarding surgical treatment and care. It is a very, very fundamental uh, concept in uh, medical ethics. And Justice uh, Benjamin Cardozo in 1914 laid it out in this landmark statement and judgment where he said that every human being of adult years and sound mind has the right to determine what shall be done with his own body. That is not refuted till today. And now with the advent of evidence-based medicine, as a matter of fact, uh, informed consent, patient autonomy is part of it. You notice here it says, decision made about healthcare should be made by those receiving care. So it's not the, the medical personnel that make decision. Our own job is to um, offer the choices, explain, the choices to the patient, and then the patient is the one that makes the decision. If you look at this uh, diagram, it shows there among the uh, things that compose evidence-based medicine, patient values is there on at the bottom left. Nevertheless, gaining access to quality surgical care can still be a challenge for some patients who decline blood transfusion, uh, in spite of the fact that autonomy is a very well-established concept of medical ethics. And this case report we are presenting uh, illustrates that difficulty and how it is overcome by having respect for the patient's um, wishes. So we are presenting a 42-year-old female Jehovah's Witness from a neighboring state presented with a huge neck swelling of 11 years duration. It had been diagnosed already as a simple multinodular goiter, and it was associated with breathlessness on exertion, noisy breathing on lying on the left side, five years, and the voice seemed to be changing too the, over the past two years uh, prior to presentation. She had no dysphagia, uh, no heat or cold intolerance, no features of toxicity at all, and no swellings anywhere else on her body. 
He had been to various health institutions over these 11 years, and she was consistently offered surgery with blood transfusion. She declined, of course. He eventually contacted the Hospital Information Service of Jehovah's Witnesses for assistance. The HIS didn't contact us, but the patient says that they asked her to come to us. So she came to our center and presented in the family medicine department. And family medicine then referred to bloodless surgery. Um, let me move on there. Um, so in her past medical history, there was no previous admission to hospital, no previous surgery, nothing of significance. And then the drug history also, nothing significant. In the family history, she's the first of six children in a monogamous setting. And again, nothing significant, no similar problem in the family. And in her social history, she's married to a five year old farmer with two children. She doesn't take alcohol or tobacco in any form. So she had a many care 15 years and um, she was perimonopausal. She, um, we saw her in 2019 and she had, she saw her last period in 2018. Uh, her two, one male, one female, all alive. And she had um, five years. So nothing else was found in review of systems. And on examination, we found a middle-aged uh, woman with obvious huge anterior neck swelling, no painful or respiratory distress, but there was stridor, and uh, she was not pale, um, the signs were normal. And we found that she had this huge neck mass, which was more than 13 cm vertically and 18 cm horizontally. We find both anterior triangles left to right, left more than right, and extending from the submandibular region to the thoracic inlet. Uh, it moved up and down with swallowing, not, but not with tongue protrusion, which confirmed that it was really a thyroid uh, mass. Uh, we found that the, the trachea was deviated to the right. Uh, there were no leaf nodes and nothing else of significance. There were prominent neck plates and we couldn't reach below it, suggesting retrosternal extension. She didn't have eye signs, just normal, every other thing, every other region normal. She came with an X-ray of the neck and um, tracheal deviation. You can see that marked tracheal deviation and evidence of retrosternal extension. The deviation of the trachea was to the right with a bit of lateral narrowing, but there was no anterior posterior narrowing. Chest X-ray still showed the tracheal deviation, normal long fields and borderline cardiomegaly. In the full blood count, she had a PCV of 37%. Uh, nothing else really significant. The analysis was normal, and the diagnosis of simple multinodular goiter. To rule out neoplastic goiter was made because there was a nodule that was hard, it felt. So further investigations were ordered along with indirect laryngoscopy, and she was reviewed by a multidisciplinary bloodless surgery team, and then book for surgery. A thyroid ultrasound, it was really the left lobe of the thyroid that was really enlarged. Uh, the right lobe showed um, just mild enlargement. And the conclusion was multi-cystic, multinodular goiter. Thyroid function tests were normal, indirect laryngoscopy normal, she, she was, uh, admitted and booked for subtotal thyroidectomy. He gave her DPA and uh, we used hemoq to check her hemoglobin. It was 11.2 gram per deal. So uh, at surgery, we used the general anesthesia, placed her in reverse Trendelenburg and gave her tranexamic acid. And also we used uh, diathlon and um, I'll skip through much of this for lack of time, but we tried to be careful with hemostasis right from raising the flap. Try to, to like get vessels before it, uh, cutting them. So the right lobe 
of her thyroid was found to be normal and attached by normal ismut to the diseased left lobe. So there was really no reason to, to remove it. So we ligated the left superior thyroid vessels and superior thyroid vessels, uh, we still then divided them. And we dissected that lobe free and excised it completely along with the ismus, which was divided between clamps. So again, careful hemostasis was done and eventually we closed and placed a drain. Uh, Post-op orders were given for pain, anti-inflammatory and patient nurse in propped up position. She made uneventful recoveries, except just that she had a bit of trachitis and uh, fever, which we diagnosed as malaria, gave her anti-malarial, she was okay. And, uh, and she was also an antibiotic because of trachitis. The unical pain, that the drain we used was removed third day post-op. And she was discharged on third day post-op with hemoglobin of 10.3. On oral hematinics, six months later, she, uh, the hemoglobin was 11.7, which is actually higher than what she had pre -op. So uh, conclusion, patient requesting bloodless care sometimes have challenges in accessing quality care. That should not be so because um, this journal article shows that it was an advocacy before, um, the bloodless surgery was an advocacy, but it shouldn't be so now. It's now seen as a desirable approach for all patients, defined as a safe, effective team approach to medicine and surgery that reduces blood loss and uses the best available alternative allergenic transfusion. Uh, therapy while focusing on the provision of the best possible medical care to all patients. So, and the World Health Organization are safer, less expensive, and maybe equally effective. Uh, the, these are pillars that the World Health Organization has given us for patient blood management. They took it from bloodless medicine and surgery. The only pillar that we added or that we have in addition is to optimize tissue oxygenation. That all others are the same. So this was the bloodless thyroidectomy done for this patient. And um, you can see how happy she is with the results. Uh, all we needed is just to maybe to protect uh, anybody is for her to give this uh, durable power of attorney, which she did happily. And you can see one of the factors making bloodless surgery desirable is that it apart from avoiding all those hazards and adverse outcomes. So we want to know that patient autonomy is the number one principle of medical ethics. And ethical evidence-based medicine requires respect for patient autonomy. Practice of bloodless surgery may be considered the epitome of rest. Surgery is considered a win-win because it also leads to improved clinical outcomes with lower mobility and mortality. In the case of patients who decline blood transfusion, it makes our job easier. Respect for patient autonomy by employing bloodless surgery techniques comes with a bonus of excellent outcomes in good multidisciplinary hands. They should not need to be going up and down looking for somebody to care for them. We should be particularly grateful and helpful to patients who request bloodless surgery because they help us improve a track record as clinician, because they have less of mobility and mortality to discuss. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Osoro. Oh, like if you look at that before and after picture of your patient and that smile at the end says it all, that, um, that impact of putting the patient at the center of our care and respecting their wishes, um, so, you know, with that in mind, um, you know, I think uh, you know, when I consider that this patient had to attend to those other hospitals before who either didn't have the knowledge or the training to do bloodless medicine and surgery, it's uh, so beneficial for her that she found you. So the question that comes from Samuel is, can a remediation or a request to the, may, be made to the United Nations that encourages governments and other organizations to get bloodless medicine and surgery incorporated into our 
medical and nursing schools. Hmm. I think that question may be better answered by those who might have links with uh, such international organizations as United Nations and World Health Organization. I don't know whether Dr. Chanda might be able to help us there or Dr. Arbach, but I do think that yes, we should encourage. Um, what, what was the question, sir? I'm sorry. Sure. The question was when we consider the the impact of um, you know, the importance of bloodless medicine and surgery and patient blood management strategies, can a request be made to the United Nations to incorporate bloodless medicine and surgery, or perhaps you know anemia management, blood health, into our universities where we're training our doctors and nurses? I don't think the United well, Nations would help you at all but I'm not the person uh, to mean, answer the question. I think World Health Organization would be the more intelligent organization, no? Well, WHO, it really has no jurisdiction over uh, educational matters of universities. I, you know, I think, uh, I guess I, I wasn't really clear because this question comes up. You know, you look at both sides of the coin. One side is the bloodless and the other side is the blood, right? And if you look at education of blood, uh, it's, it, it is it's preposterous, it's terrible. And, uh, you know, we're living in the world where the amount of knowledge of people actually using this particular therapeutic intervention is deplorable. And, uh, and now we're asking the same institutions to take on something which requires, again, knowledge of blood, as I mentioned, but also requires uh, them to uh, make an opening, if you will, uh, in their curriculum, which I don't think is going to happen. So I think we need to be realistic uh, in both sides of these. And, and you know, I, I like to I like to quote uh, Mark Chasson, who is the medical director was of the Joint Commission, who basically said that he has uh, given up on uh, medical education, uh, organized medical, meaning universities, meaning the ones who teach medicine. And he says that uh, the best place to actually change and enhance knowledge and skills is in the postgraduate period, because all of our attempts, and we've had many, and all of our, um, I guess, proposals to universities were first, uh, with first sort of the response, initial response were enthusiastic, but at the end of the day, they are so overloaded with what they need to produce as curriculum, which by the way, does not make for good doctors or good nurses, and it's just curriculum. Um, they don't really have uh, an opening uh, or they say they have to take something else off and they don't know how to prioritize that. So we're back to where we are now. And that is um, the postgraduate um, is the place because that's when students interface with patients and makes, I think, the education much more real. And also I think the skills that are needed uh, can be, um, can be uh, taught and transmitted by multiple people rather than you know one professor standing in front of a classroom. So, um, I hate to sound, um, and I, I don't mean to be negative. I don't think it's a negative. I think it's a reality test. So it would be nice if if we had a universal way of changing our medical curriculum. I have so many suggested, not just bloodless, if we need to do that. Thank you so much uh, for helping me out. Those were my thoughts as well. I think we have to work from within. Yes. In department, we have lectures for medical students. Uh, my faculty, incidentally, Dr. Ngim is not just a professor of orthopedic surgery. Uh, he's also the dean of the Faculty of Clinical Sciences in my center. And he is a founding member of the Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Group. So um, in fact, he may have we, we're also encouraging the faculty to, um, you know, incorporate bloodless and blood conservation in the various departments that make up the faculty. I know he's a moderator, but he might have a comment that he wants. 
Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Osoro, for your presentation and the comments by, <clears throat> by, uh, by Becky and uh, Dr. Shanda. Yes, truly, bloodless medicine is, uh, is important for you to be cooperating in undergraduate medical training. And I think uh, that is to start from the level of individual medical schools. And then from there, it can be built and expanded upon. Like Dr. Tosoro has said, in our own medical school, we produce bits and pieces of it at the undergraduate medical training level. And we believe it will impact positively on the, these young doctors when they begin to practice medicine in our communities around you know, our country. So I think that uh, the action needs to start locally from individual medical schools. And eventually, as momentum grows, the WHO may be brought in to expand the reach across the world. That's what I think uh, needs to be done to further push this uh, concept to various uh, medical schools out there. Thank you. Thank you. It definitely sounds like it's the work of uh, organizations like this to definitely promote these success cases and uh, and get the, the news and the knowledge out there. Um, we do have one more question um, for you specifically, uh, Dr. Usoro, that comes from Habib, and they're wondering, what are the special steps taken in a bloodless thyroidectomy in this case that are different from a routine thyroidectomy? Oh, sorry, actually, Dr. Usoro, it should, it should, yeah, it should actually be the same thing. I mean, we should use the same techniques for all patients. That, that's how it should be. Uh, somebody did that, um, Theodore Coker, and he did thousands of thyroidectomies. He won a Nobel Prize. He had very minimal um, mortality, less than 1%. So, uh, it's, it follows those four pillars. You want to optimize that patient's hemoglobin. So that means you need to know what it is. We can use HemoQ or some point of care testing right from the outpatient to screen. And uh, we can try to we want to raise that hematocrit before surgery. Uh, and, uh, we want to take a good history also. Does the patient have any situation that might predispose him or her to hemorrhage or excessive hemorrhage during surgery. Some patients have some bleeding disorder. We want to get them and treat them before we go for surgery. Um, so we want to have a multidisciplinary team review these patients. Who are members of the Godless Group. So we might favor those ones to care for challenging cases like this one. Hematologists to take a look, especially if there's abnormality, you know, and um, even the radiologist, you know, might have a share, depending. So that um, helps us to cover almost everything. Uh, you know, many heads are better than one. And then at surgery, we want to put in um, things in place to minimize blood loss during surgery. In those days, we used to do acute normal volemic hemodilution for our patients, but we rarely do that now because with tranexamic acid, when we add vitamin K to it, we rarely have much blood loss to justify uh, ANH because you must, have, must be having like up to a thousand liters, sorry, a thousand above to justify ANH. So we, we I haven't done it for, for a long time, uh, but I do use tranexamic acid positioning. We want to make sure that patients, um, the point where you're doing the surgery is above the right ventricle. So sometimes we've had cases where the, the patient's head is down and somebody's doing a thyroidectomy. Of course, there'll be blood everywhere. Uh, so one thing to note of that meticulous hemostasis may take time. Some surgeries are very fast. But whether we are fast or slow, we need to be medical. That means we don't leave a bleeder to keep bleeding. And so don't worry, uh, let's carry on. No, because if, if we come upon a more serious hemorrhage, we may not be able to know where it's coming from because everywhere is filled with blood. But if we keep stopping our, our performing hemostasis as we go along, 
if we come on something major, then we, we know where it's coming from and we can easily get it. So we use diatomy and uh, uh, we can actually, we, we may be able to, if we have a cell server, blood salvage facilities, and we do come up on major blood loss, we can recycle it. Um, so that's it, this pressure, simple pressure. You now sometimes you have like these huge goiters, they will have a gorge uh, veins and inevitably sometimes you end up rupturing them before having gained full control. Just ask the assistant to put pressure on it and you know, um, try and get that thyroid out. Uh, stop, uh, get, get, get control of those um, superior and inferior thyroid vessels. In, uh, I try and get control of them before anything else. And then, or I mean, before you dissect the, the thyroid out. So I think that basically covers it, put a drain and uh, be okay. Definitely sounds some, like some meticulous work is needed for sure. So I think um, Professor McGim is going to wrap up our session and then I'm going to share some highlights about uh, tomorrow's events. Off, or am I off? Is it still there? For some game? It looks like maybe the network has thrown him out. Oh. So, Becky, it's okay, up to you. Sure, absolutely. Um, so, um, well, Dr. Usoro is going to bring up uh, the schedule um, for, for up on the screen for you to view tomorrow. I want to say a thank you to everyone who has attended today. There were certainly some excellent presentations, excellent abstracts, a lot of discussion certainly should, uh, should carry forth after today. Um, there have been a number of questions that people have asked about the slides and the presentations being available for future viewing. And I think my understanding is that these presentations, the videos, will all be available on the Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Society's YouTube channel. So please look for that. If there is any um, uh, different information about that, I'll ask uh, for those in the know to chime in. But in addition to thanking you for attending today, we certainly hope that you attend tomorrow. Tomorrow is, again, uh, a packed schedule with a lot of excellent information. The day is going to start out with the Bloodless Medicine Education Symposium, where we'll be hearing about education experiences in Malaysia, uh, presented by Dr. Jamila Sathar, and the experience in, in Spain by Professor Xavier Soler Abel. And then we'll hear about the nurse as an important uh, piece of the Bloodless Educating Committee. And that's going to be presented by Sherry Ozawa, who I think is going to be presenting from uh, her time right now in Australia. The second half of the symposium will be about bloodless surgery techniques. We'll hear about perioperative anemia management without using blood from Professor Vernon Lau. And then we'll hear about the experience in critical care medicine from Dr. Stephen Frank and also in trauma by Dr. Aaron Sudam. And we'll end the day with some industry presentations. So thank you very much to everyone for attending. Thank you to our excellent panelists and presenters today. We hope you enjoyed it and we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you thank very much, you. everyone. Thank uh, see you. you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think I will stay on a bit and try to answer some of the questions that I might have been remaining. Uh, all the questions transfused. Oh, okay. All right. I think. Okay, I think Zoom will give us these questions and we shall answer them um, better. <laughs>